Good afternoon. The meeting will now come to order. Hello, I'm Donna Savigny, President of the Board of Education, and I would like to welcome you to the September 23rd, 2020 Board Updates meeting. In keeping with the Board's commitment to open communication with the community, this meeting is being streamed live on the CCPS website at www.carolk12.org and broadcast live on Channel 21. We are also recording this meeting so that it can be accessed on demand on our website and broadcast throughout the month on Channel 21. This will be a hybrid meeting in which some board members are present in the boardroom. However, some board members and staff will be participating virtually. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, the public will not be able to attend the meeting with the exception of those who wish to speak during citizen participation. Citizen participation is scheduled on the agenda for approximately 5 p.m. Speakers will be allowed in the meeting room individually for the allotted three minutes to address the board. Citizens who wish to speak must adhere to the social distancing guidelines and safety precautions we have previously publicized in communications about public comment for this meeting. Citizens must wear a mask while in the building and also when addressing the board. The Board of Education will also continue taking public comment related to tonight's agenda items through alternate means. Citizens not appearing in person for public comment can write to the board through email or U.S. mail. Comments received will be posted on the website. For board members and staff who are participating in the virtual meeting, I would remind us all to silence our cell phones and other devices around us that the microphones may pick up. Also, we should each silence our microphones when we are not speaking. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Okay, board members, I need a motion for the approval of the agenda. So moved. Moved by Ms. Battaglia. I'll second that. Seconded by Dr. Dorsey. Uh, board members, any comments or revisions? I believe we do we need to add that we're going to go back into close after the meeting. Oh, yes, thank you. So we'll make that statement now that we, ca we went into recess while we were enclosed. We did not finish our closed session. So immediately after the ending of this meeting, we will be going back into closed session this evening. Thank you, Ms. Battaglia, for that. Okay, board members, any other items to add or revise on the agenda? No? Okay, then with that, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, can I get a verbal aye, please? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously, thank you. And we will move right into public participation. All right, here we go. To have an orderly presentation of comments by the public, the following guidelines apply. Speakers will be allowed in the boardroom individually for the allotted three minutes to address the board. Citizens who wish to speak must adhere to the social distancing guidelines and safety precautions we have previously publicized in communications about public comments for this meeting. All citizens must wear a mask in the building and when addressing the board. Citizens not appearing in person for public comment can write to the board through email or U.S. mail. All citizens must wear a mask in the building and when addressing the board. Number two, citizens, citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. However, if citizens have specific questions, the superintendent will assign a staff member to make contact during the board meeting to arrange a time to respond to questions. Number three, the superintendent board reserve the right to correct misinformation presented at, as factual after the conclusion of the citizen participation period. Number four, statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item and an agenda item that is expected to appear in the near future or a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Personnel matters, pending appeals, the action or statements of individual staff or items related to employee negotiations are not appropriate topics and may not be discussed. It is the intent of the board to allow all citizens an opportunity to speak. Therefore, the 
board has scheduled time on the agenda for citizen participation. The board reserves the right to limit the number of speakers on a particular topic so that all topics may be addressed. If 30 minutes has passed and there are citizens who have not addressed the board, additional time may be allotted later in the meeting. Number six, comments are limited to three minutes or less. When the allotted time expires, the speaker is com permitted to complete a sentence and return to the audience. The public may not display signs or posters during the board meeting. In lieu of signs, or if you are unable to complete your comment in the allotted time, the individual is encouraged to submit remarks to the board in writing. Our first speaker tonight is Linda Dye. Hi, I'm Linda Dye, and I'm here representing the Carroll County Jewish community and the 954 people who have signed our petition to delay one day. As you know, the current proposal for next school year has the students starting on September 7th, which also happens to be Rosh Hashanah, one of the holiest days on the Jewish calendar. We are asking you, please, to delay next school year by one day. We are asking you to respect the students and staff of CCPS by not starting school on a religious holiday. No student or staff should have to choose between a major school event and their religion. No student should have to start the school year without their teachers. I know that many people think there aren't many Jewish people here in Carroll County. We don't have a brick and mortar temple here. You don't see us wearing our Jewish stars proudly. And let me tell you why. It's because we're afraid. Anti-Semitism is a real thing and we've all experienced it. We don't wear our Jewish stars and advertise our Jewishness to protect ourselves and our families. We don't outwardly advertise our high holiday services because we're afraid. Starting school on a Jewish holiday will be putting a target on some of our teachers and students' backs. Why else would a student miss the first day of school, and more importantly, a teacher? I fear our community will not honor their faith to protect themselves and their identity. Please don't make Jewish students and staff and CCPS make that decision. Delay one day. We are not asking you to close on Yom Kippur. However, I would like to provide a bit of context around the closing for the Jewish High Holy Days. In 2009, CCPS determined there was a need to close. Last year, despite the educational equity policy, which states that CCPS creates schools, will, will create schools with a welcoming, inclusive culture, the board voted to no longer close on these two days. This decision was based on a survey that asked the general public their opinion about closing on the Holy Days. No decision that has such a major impact on our students and our staffs should be based on opinion, especially of the general public. At the least, the survey should have been sent directly to CCPS families so that the data was accurate and the board can make a better informed decision. Last year was a particularly hard year to fit our days between Labor Day and June 15th. We recognized that challenge. We did not fight to keep our holy days. We were not clear that this would affect our future years. The board is on record saying that you would discuss the closing of Yom Kippur in the future years. I have yet to hear a discussion. Next year, we're scheduled to end on June 10th. That is with the snow days. There is plenty of time to delay one day and maybe even to close for Yom Kippur, the holiest of the Jewish holidays. I want to thank you for listening and one last time to ask you to delay one day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for coming tonight. Next, we have Amy Sharpneck. Amy? Dear members of the Board of Education, Commissioner Frazier and Dr. Lockhart, I come before you today to represent my entire kindergarten team. We are a team of five teachers ranging from first year to 35 years of teaching. We have all taken many of the training opportunities that were provided to us over the summer so that we could attempt to be prepared and provide the best learning opportunity for our children. One training preparing for the 2021 school year social, emotional, and mental health stands out to me as we start this discussion of hybrid. This training reminds us to take care of ourselves before we take care of others so we can do the best. If I'm not taking care of myself, I cannot give my students my best. Currently, I'm not taking care of myself nor have my teammates. We have all worked an average of 12 plus hours every day since we've returned. And actually in the first two weeks, we averaged 14 hour days between planning and teaching. 
This usually includes phone calls, text messages, as early as 7 a.m. and as late as 9.30 p.m., and many hours on the weekend. Not to mention, the information keeps changing minute by minute with expectations. There are not enough hours in this day for me or my teammates to take care of ourselves, fulfill the expectations that have been given, and be the teachers we want to be. Those loving, caring, engaging teachers that spark the love of learning into our young students' minds. Instead, we are overwhelmed, frustrated, and stressed. In hybrid, we will be planning for two completely different formats, and with this comes many questions. Currently, my students are all able to complete the same type of independent work. However, in hybrid, some students will be completing an activity in a drag and drop format on the computer. But the students in the classroom would be cutting and pasting. You can't drag and drop on a piece of paper in the classroom. It'll be very confusing to teach two different sets of routines at the same time when modeling and giving a direction. Another concern is my small group instruction. Currently, my students are successfully joining at the same time for their small group that meets their instructional needs. However, how do I teach to children online and in person a small group without disrupting the rest of the children who are trying to learn in the room? With each question comes many more stresses. Some might say, if you can't handle the stress, take a leave. However, I am a single person. I cannot afford to take a leave of absence. I do not qualify to take leave under ADA, nor do I have a child care issue or a family member in a household I must directly care for. Not to mention, teaching is my job. It is a job I love. It is a job I've wanted to do since I was seven years old. It is who I am. I want to be with my children. I want to see them succeed and grow. You might ask how my stress and mental health impacts the students. Well, that is simple. I need to take care of myself first so I can take care and teach them the way they deserve to be taught. I'm not sure I can do that with the current expectations of implementing a hybrid model. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Ryan Casey. <clears throat> Good afternoon, dear Dr. Lockard, members of the board, and Mr. Singer. I'm a parent of two children in Carroll County Public Schools, and I'm a graduate of South Carroll High School. The first two weeks of virtual education have been excellent for my children. The teachers have been amazing in converting their classes to remote instruction. Today, I share my perspective gained as a scientist and as chair of the chemistry department at Towson University. I'm speaking as a parent, and I am not representing Towson University. I am concerned that I have not seen any plan to require COVID testing for students or staff before a return to in-person instruction. Almost every higher ed institution required negative tests from staff and students prior to returning to campus. I have seen no justification that the risk of COVID transmission is any different in K-12 schools. In the absence of testing, CCPS is hoping for the best, but has no means to assess risk to students or their families. I am sure there is a fiscal challenge to this level of testing. However, if we can't afford adequate testing to ensure a safe educational environment, it is inappropriate and even negligent to just hope for the best and return in person anyway. When Towson University required COVID testing prior to resuming campus activities, they found high rates of infection among people who previously had no reason to be tested, in some weeks as high as 18% positivity. During the same period, Baltimore County had 3 to 5% positivity. It appears there is a much higher rate of asymptomatic infection among Towson students than was previously expected from testing in the local community. Contact tracing showed that this was community spread and not the result of a few big parties. Instead, these students may be more frequently exposed in the community than we expected, possibly through jobs, socializing, or recreational activities. It is possible that the rate of COVID infection among the population being tested in Carroll County is not predictive of the rate of infection among the students and staff in our schools. Without testing, how do we know? Many institutions consider a transmissible exposure to occur if someone is within six feet of an infected person for greater than 15 minutes, even with a mask. Even at 50% capacity, every student attending school in person will be subject to potentially transmissible exposures every day on CCPS campuses. If we don't know who is infected, how are we controlling that spread? Amen. Virtual learning is a logistical and technical nightmare for many families. However, if school resumes for hybrid delivery, teacher contact will decrease for all students and will decrease precipitously for families that remain remote. As a parent, I am frankly angry that CCPS has me choosing between a quality remote education and some undefined risk to the health of my children and family. 
Evidence from institutions nationwide suggests that congregating students will spread the virus. I am not a public health expert, but as a scientist, I cannot explain away that risk or conclude that my children are safe in resuming in-person schooling. I would like to thank Dr. Lockhart, the board, and Mr. Singer for all the work you've already done managing the response of Carroll County and CCPS to the pandemic. As a fellow educator, I know the immense amount of work and planning that have gone into every decision. I know the constant planning for contingencies and unknowns is exhausting, and I appreciate your service to the county. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Next, we have Diana Flores. Good evening. My name is Diana Flores. I'm currently a senior at Winters Mill High School. I have come in tonight to speak on the struggles that teachers and students in Carroll County have been facing, will continue to face, and will face if the hybrid model is placed. After speaking to some high school teachers about their personal experiences, I have found that teachers are being overwhelmed with the, with the workload, much more than if we were in our traditional brick and mortar education. After school, from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m., they get about 40 emails. Teachers, is all, have also, teachers also have their lesson plans to complete, which I heard is taking three times as long as it takes in a traditional school setting. In addition, they have to organize their Google Classrooms and help students with the technology. Teachers barely have enough time in their day to complete all of the things I just mentioned, and grading is extremely time and energy consuming. I have also seen the tremendous amount of work my cousins and sisters middle and elementary school teachers have been completing. Although I've not spoken to many of them personally about this topic, I've seen that they're also under an extraordinary amount of stress. Now from what I have heard, it sounds like Carroll County Public Schools is greatly pushing to reopen, to, to reopen schools in a hybrid model as of October 19th, 2020. Our school communities are barely getting accustomed to this virtual model. Being thrown into a hybrid model will bring about much more stress for everyone involved. With the consideration of everything I've seen, heard, and experienced, I highly disagree with the hybrid model. It would simply bring about more stress and disorganization, along with many health concerns. In Carroll County Public Schools, there are many teachers who have health, health conditions, teachers who are pregnant, and teachers at higher risk because of their age. I know everyone has continuously tried to keep the best interests of all students in mind, and we all truly appreciate it. But I want to voice my opinion and the opinion of my peers. If we go back to school in the hybrid model, it is certain that we will get at least one case of, COVID, of the COVID-19 virus within our school communities. From there, it is possible that a student or staff member will die. This will result in a massive amount of grief and guilt on our students. We will feel at fault because everyone is saying that this is all being done for us. For us, when this is not what we want. We want our virtual model improved. We do not want to be back in school with the risk of further spreading the COVID-19 virus. I repeat, the hybrid model is not what we want. We need less stress on our students and teachers. We need more time within the school day to take care of ourselves and focus on our own mental health rather than being glued to the computer all day doing schoolwork. I understand, acknowledge, and empathize the different situations and opinions within our county. I in no way am discounting all of the work being done to help students, nor am I ignoring the mental health crisis we've been facing. Rather, I personally have been attempting to shine a light on both of these aspects. With careful consideration and many hours spent listening and learning from my peers' experiences, situations, and opinions, we will benefit more from an improved virtual model rather than entering the hybrid model. Please finish Thank you your, for your thoughts. Time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming tonight. Victoria Neflin. Victoria? Good evening, my name is Victoria Neflin. Uh, I'm the daughter of a Westminster High School administrator. I'm the proud big sister of a Winters Mill High School student and I'm also a former Carroll County Public School student myself. What you may not know about me looking at me though is that I'm also currently battling a rare cancer called myelofibrosis. What this means is that I'm anemic, I'm immunocompromised, and should I get COVID-19, there's a good chance that I could die. And I'm honestly petrified just being here right now. 
However, in spite of it all, I'm here today to beg you to keep schools virtual and to not adopt the hybrid model for not just my safety, but that of all other immunocompromised citizens in Carroll County. At the age of 22, and after having recently graduated college, I would have never thought that I would have to find myself behind this panel begging for my life. But I didn't choose to be diagnosed with cancer in the middle of a rampant pandemic. I didn't choose to have my sole provider and singular caretaker be a staff member for CCPS. And yet, because of these variables completely out of my control, I now find myself and my life threatened by the decision that this board makes. To be clear, evidence shows that reopening schools has proven to be a failure in districts all across the country. Even with lower rates of COVID-19 infection, all it takes is one case to spark an outbreak, and then people like me who live with and are cared for by staff and students in the school system will likely fall ill and die. Westminster High School has already recorded multiple cases of COVID-19, as was referenced in the Carroll County Times. I've had to watch my mother cry over the thought of leaving for work, knowing she's stepping foot in a building that could put my life at risk. Can you imagine what it's like watching your own mother grapple with your mortality as she simply strives to put food on the table? What's worse is that students weren't even in the building. How can we prevent an outbreak of COVID when students um, are in the building if we can't even prevent one when students are learning virtually. So when you decide whether to return to in-person learning, know that my life and the lives of people like me hang in the balance. Can you honestly look me in my eyes and say that my death is a price you're willing to pay? That my family's guilt for killing me through no fault of their own is the trade-off for getting kids back into schools? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, Vanessa Stewart. Good evening, board members, Dr. Lockhart and staff. I came and spoke to you in August, and now I feel the need to come again. Uh, I will remind you, uh, I am a 22-year veteran in this county, uh, and I want to let you know that I do believe you made the right decision to go virtual uh, when you did make that decision, with the caveat for special education and career in tech. I thought that was a smart decision and the wisest decision to make with the information you had at the time. Uh, I also want you to know that I watch the board meetings in entirety, all five hours that you all have to sit here uh, or longer, um, and I sit at home watching along with you and hearing what you have to say. I feel for you because I know being public servants, your every words are criticized and <laughs> um, torn out of proportion and all kinds of different things, and I cannot imagine how much that tears at you. Um, but I do want to... Uh, bring up two things to you tonight. First of all, um, my special education students are not in school. There are no special education students in my school, and I was under the impression that that's, they would be there, and they're not. Uh, my little guys are seven years old, and one has to watch recordings due to his parents' job, and the other is in front of the computer more than his classmates due to his hours for services to being, meet, being met. And his parents both cry to me over the fact, or both of their parents cry to me over the fact that their child is falling behind, even further behind and so forth, and it breaks my heart. I think it's wrong um, that they're not in school um, because they are not as special needs, or I don't know what the reason is, but it breaks my heart because I thought that they were going to be there. Uh, my other reason for being here is that uh, I got an email yesterday from my administration that sent me over the edge. Uh, I was shown that a picture that I have to stay in a zone like this and while I have seven-year-olds, about, you know, probably 11, 12 of them right in front of me, sitting six feet apart with masks on while I have a mask on, while I have a computer right in front of me and I'm presenting a screen and I have to stay right there. And that's not how I envision the best instruction to happen in a hybrid model. Uh, I thought that I had heard in the many conversations that Mr. Anderson said that I think even Mrs. Savigny asked specifically about this and he said no they will the virtual kids will be asynchronous while those kids are uh, there in front of the teacher because that way even though I have to stand six feet apart I can be right there I mean I'm you know 
I'm getting older and my eyes are not that great. So if they have to hold up their paper that they wrote in pencil and paper and I have to see it, I'm gonna need binoculars to look from my zone so I don't leave it where I have to be synchronous with the other kids. And I just can't wrap my mind around this hybrid model and how this is gonna work. So I ask you to consider these things uh, and think about this because what was sent to me, my, my teammates and I have spent the last 24 hours trying to, you know, we're hardly sleeping as it is, and this has just put it over the edge. So I please Thank consider you. this. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. And that concludes um, citizen participation. The only employee group we have is uh, Teresa McCullough, um, CCEA. And while Ms. McCullough is coming in, I just wanted to take the opportunity to make one correction. Um, earlier on in the summer, when we were talking about the hybrid model, as the speaker referenced, um, you're welcome to come, come in, Mr. Yep. Um, we had that that was some original conversation around the synchronous and asynchronous, and remember we had a lot of conversation here at the board. But if you'll recall, um, recently the Maryland State Department of Education has required us to have three and a half hours of synchronous instruction a day. So you can't not have synchronous instruction with um, students who are at home virtually. Um, so we're, we, are, we are trying to, when we can get into this later on. Absolutely. But to, to the speaker's credit, that was correct. Um, but um, the game changed on us um, throughout the summer to where the requirements were such that we don't have a choice now um, in terms of when that's delivered. So I'm sorry, Ms. McCullough. Good evening, Superintendent Locker, members of the Board of Education. And do we have a commissioner with us today? No. Okay. I am Teresa Basler McCullough, president of the Carroll County Education Association, who represents the dedicated, hardworking teachers, counselors, RNs, speech language therapists, OTs, and PTs who are persevering daily in enhanced virtual learning. I know as leaders, we have been checking in with our employees and members to make sure all is well. But who's checking in on you, making sure you are okay? I know you can't answer this orally, but I am going to ask anyway, how are each one of you doing? <laughs> Tonight's report is structured using a graphic organizer called a KWL chart. K is for what we know. We know that Dr. Lockhart, Chiefs, and directors have kept the lines of communication open and are readily available, which is appreciated. We know the current method of virtual instruction now has definitely been enhanced. We know that educators and students find more success with consistency and continuity. And we know that teachers are putting in 10 to 12 hour days, six to seven days a week, and we know that is not sustainable. W stands for what we wonder or what we want to know. We wonder if students will thrive as much in the hybrid model as it seems they are doing in virtual enhanced learning. We wonder when we move to hybrid if school operations, educators, and students will experience a setback. And we wonder if disruption due to the transition to hybrid will interfere with learning. And we wonder, after receiving the hybrid slide deck yesterday, how much hybrid will increase the workload, a plate, that is already full and running over. And the L designates what we have learned. We have learned no one has all the answers. And we have learned how much numbers impact our decisions and life during this pandemic era. And we will learn that numbers shared tonight by Mr. Singer and Mrs. Baptist will have an impact on school procedures. And lastly, we have learned we are all in this together.
Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes the participation part. Tara, do you want to give this to Dr. Walker, please? Okay. That was Andy. Thanks to all who came this evening to speak. And uh, with that, we will move on to section three under reports and discussion. And the first item up is the health department dashboard metrics and lead indicators. I'm thinking we have Mr. Singer on the line. And uh, Dr. Locker, do you wanna do you wanna kick us off and then we can hand it over to Ed? Sure, thank you. So every time we've been meeting, Mr. Singer has been updating us on um, metrics that the board um, spent a lot of time sort of vetting and talking about and thinking that are important to us. Um, and I know that uh, Ed and I speak just about every day on the telephone. And so uh, he's been incredibly helpful, continues to be, he and his whole department. And so there comes the presentation. So Mr. Singer, if you would, the floor is yours. And board members, that's, I'm sorry, uh, Bob, that's, oh yeah, that's it. Um, uh, that should be it. Um, and uh, Mr. Singer, are you there? I'm here. Um, I'm just not used to, to having the purple CCPS background, but that's okay. Um, we'll, we'll roll with it. Uh, can we have the next slide? Ah, there we go. All right. Um, just uh, so I just want to go through this dashboard real quick and, and talk about kind of where we are and uh, where things might be headed. Uh, the one starting at the top with the uh, community cases per week, uh, way back, uh, I don't remember how long ago it was, you all asked me if I could provide you some metrics that would be helpful in uh, trying to determine when it was appropriate to reopen schools. And before the state or the CDC had put anything out, we, we kind of came up with this number, which equates to about three cases per 100,000 uh, population in Carroll County, or 35 cases per week that I said I'd want to see over a over a two-week period. Um, I guess back August 30th, we, we, uh, th there have been some peaks and valleys as, as we've gone through this pandemic. And August 30th, we, we had had 88 cases. And there's been a, uh, a, a pretty steady downward uh, trend, both statewide and in Carroll County, with the number of cases over the, uh, over the last few weeks. Um, as you see, at the week of 913, we stood with 53 cases. As of today, um, in, in, in Carroll County, our, our community cases stand at uh, 16 for the week. So we're halfway through the week. So it seems that we're continuing with that downward trend as, as we're heading into uh, the month of October, as you guys approach the date when uh, you, you set for wanting to potentially reopen with your hybrid model. Uh, the total cases uh, per day, based on the, the guides the governor put out with the uh, the five cases per 100,000, we're, we're now, and, th and this includes all the cases, not only the community cases, but the cases in facilities. Uh, we stand at 4.7, which is below that metric. Uh, the positivity rate from the state standpoint has stayed pretty relatively low in Carroll County. And even even the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, positivity rate is uh, is declining, as, as you can see statewide. Um, ICU bed usage and, and the, the uh, community deaths have not been really an issue, not been a factor on the things that we've been uh, talking about. So moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, I'm still looking at the same one. Can I get the uh, next slide, please? Ed, we're Hi. seeing it on our screen. Are you seeing the the CDC's information on your screen? There we go, okay. now I'm good. Maybe I'm just lagging or something. So um, I, I know CDC put out a uh, put out a chart this week that uh, is supposed to help guide schools and when it's safe to reopen. And it's, it's interesting, I wanted to uh, share with you all, I know uh, Ms. Svigny <laughs> sent me this, uh, this, this graphic and uh, we, we had talked some about it but I guess I wanted to share with the board and with the public, you know, how what we've been tracking fits in with what the CDC's, um, what the CDC's guidance is. And be quite honest, you know, I think when we're talking about trying to get back in schools, I think trying, trying to get to the point where we're at a moderate risk of transmission 
is a reasonable place to be when we talk about trying to reopen schools. We're never going to have zero risk. Um, it's, you know, we could try and try and try to get the zero risk, but you're never going to get there. So unless, unless you're planning on keeping schools closed and we're not going to make progress to getting schools towards getting schools reopened, um, you know, there's always going to be some level of risk. We're going to see some cases and, and we're going to have to deal with those cases. And it's going to be a lot of work between our administrators, um, your, your, your nurses in the schools and whatnot, and the health department working together to deal with these, uh, with cases as, as we potentially go back to school in person. So I kind of wanted to compare where, where things stood with the recommendations I gave you. If, uh, if you do the calculation based on this chart here, and if we're looking at the, uh, at the top row where it talks about number of cases per 100,000 persons within the last 14 days, if you use the metric that I, that I gave you early on, the uh, 35 community cases um, in Carroll County per week, and you do the calculation, it comes out to 41.67, which puts us in that moderate risk range. It puts us right in about the middle of that moderate risk range. Um, if you look at the governor's metric, that comes out um, actually in the higher risk range. If you're looking at the uh, five, five cases per 100,000 population, and that equates, according to the CDC chart, to what would be considered a, a, uh, a higher risk of transmission. So kind of looking at, if we think that moderate risk of transmission, and ultimately you all have to make this decision as to whether you're willing to accept a moderate risk of transmission, because we are going to see cases with a, with a uh, moderate risk of transmission. We're going to have to manage those cases, and we're going to have to uh, potentially quarantine and isolate um, kids and potentially staff members. And uh, with, a, with a moderate risk of transmission, it's almost certain we're going to see these cases. Um, but uh, I, I don't know how easy it's going to be in, in any time soon that we would be getting into this lower or lowest risk of, of, of transmission. So if we're willing to accept moderate risk, we're talking about um, in Carroll County, less than 84 cases. And this includes the facility cases and the community cases. And we can start tracking that if that's, you know, kind of what we want to track um, along with the other data that we're tracking to, to figure out where this fits with the CDC recommendations. Um, I did throw up a, a, a note here about the positivity rate. And, and I think um, if you look at the, 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 uh, second set of asterisks down at the bottom, it talks about um, how positivity rate is calculated. And the reason that I believe that the um, positivity rate is so different between what the state's calculating and what Johns Hopkins is calculating is a matter of interpretation of what the difference is between screening and surveillance. And I think Hopkins is, uh, is saying that they're not counting um, the uh, nursing home tests that are being done and, and, and some of the repetitive tests that are being done in colleges and universities as part of the screening, they, they, they're, they're considering that to be surveillance. And under this chart here, um, surveillance tests would be excluded from, from that calculation. I, I think we're actually in a pretty good place regardless of how you look at it from a positivity rate, whether it's the Hopkins rate we're looking at or whether we're looking at the, uh, at the state's rate so, so I don't think it's a big issue for us at this point in time, but I did want to point out that difference and, and why those numbers are different and, and, and talk about that a little bit. And then the last thing that's in this chart that's very important is uh, the ability of the schools to implement five key mitigation strategies. And um, those include the consistent and correct use of masks, which we don't have kids back in the, in the classroom now, but we're planning to do that. Um, well, we do have limited number of kids back in the class, but when we have when we have kids back in, in school in person, a, a larger majority of them, then th this is uh, one of the five things they think is, is important. Social distancing to the largest extent possible, which we're already planning to do. Hand hygiene and, and respiratory etiquette are important. So I, I know we've talked about hand hygiene and making sure the kids can wash their hands and sanitizers available and that type of thing cleaning and disinfection, which you all have plans for, and the contact tracing in collaboration with the local health department. And we, we've got plans for that. And, and I will tell you, um, one of the things that we're gonna see is uh, 
you know, if schools do open as you plan in the hybrid model in, in October, we're going to see a bump in cases. When uh, anything opens up, I'll, I'll use McDaniel College as an example, you're, you're going to have cases that are going to pop up and, and you're going to have to deal with those and it's going to take some time to sort through all of those and things will eventually settle themselves back out. But I would expect when, when, when you all open schools, whether it's now or whether it's later, depending on what you decide, uh, you're going to see uh, an increase in cases temporarily, at least until we, we start to get this managed and, and we, we do contact tracing and we isolate and quarantine people that are potentially sick or exposed. So I, I think that needs to be an expectation that you all need to understand. And one of the things I want to say to you tonight, and this is unsolicited, but I've heard lots of rumblings and, and I've seen letters from our delegation and whatnot talking about wanting to reopen uh, fall sports and things of that nature. And I do have a lot of concern about that from the standpoint, if we're going to reopen school and that's where our priority is, um, we really need to be careful on the other activities that we're going to reopen because we're going to see bumps not only from reopening school, but if you try to reopen sports at the same time and, and you start uh, opening things up more, you're going to see bumps from that too. And my concern is, is, if our real priority is trying to get kids back in the classroom, we need to focus on that and, and we need to try to make sure that we can manage that. And once we get kids back into the classroom and we kind of have a rhythm and we get, we get cases managed and we get, uh, we, we get the uh, potential quarantines and potential isolations managed and we have a flow to things, then I would suggest to you that that might be the most appropriate time to start at looking at reopening other things. But I, I think that it would be, you know, from, from my perspective as, as, your, uh, as your health officer, I think that it would be uh, a very difficult thing if we try to open all these things up at once. So my, my suggestion is to you that if we're going we're gonna to consider opening the schools, we really need to focus on that. And then the, um, and it may be an unpopular decision, but then we focus on those uh, extracurricular activities as extracurricular activities once you have the opportunity to get your uh, in-person learning back and going, if that's what uh, direction you decide to take. So that's kind of where, where that is. Um, can you move on to the next slide, please? This is just a slide that I've been sharing with you all each, each time. It's got the community cases. Uh, the week of September 13th, we had 53. As I said today, we, we kind of stand at 16 and we're a little more than halfway through the week. So we can hope that that uh, downward trend continues. And I can't tell you where we're going to be on, I keep saying October 16th, it might be October 18th or October 19th. I can't tell you where we're going to be on that day, but the, the, the trend statewide and the trend in Carroll County now seems to be headed in the direction that we could potentially be in that moderate uh, risk of transmission when, when we get to that date. But, you know, it's, it's we're, we're going to have to see. Um, next slide, please. This is the rolling average that I keep sharing with you. I don't think uh, I need to say anything more about that. That just kind of shows the trends, uh, a transmission over a 14-day uh, average. Next slide. Um, this is the uh, community and facility-related deaths. Um, we didn't have, we, we still haven't had any community deaths since uh, October the, uh, excuse me, August the 16th. We have had uh, several facility-related deaths in the last. Uh, a um, couple of months, and last week we had two facility-related deaths. So it really doesn't impact the uh, metrics that we're looking at for reopening schools. Next slide. And this is just the uh, ICU bed usage. A um, little bit of an uptick uh, to, towards the end of this, the, the end of this past week, uh, up to up to ten, but still in line with the metrics that we're talking about. So, next slide. And then this is the age demographics. We continue to see the highest number of cases in that 18 to 29 year old age range and, and, and a few cases in the uh, still seeing cases, not a, not a lot of cases, but uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of four or five cases or so a week in that under 18 age group. Next slide. That's all I've got. If you all have any questions for me, I'd be glad to try to have a, a discussion with you. Mr. Taglia? Mr. Singer, thank you so much. I think this is um, 
extremely positive that you know it's showing that things are going in the right direction at this point. Um, the one question I did have was the ages between the 18 and 29 that seems to be, I don't want to say the problem, but it seemed, there seem to be the ones that are, are causing the ones that for their, our numbers to be larger. In contact tracing, is any of that linked to parties, um, a big event that many, many may have attended? Um, is that something that's a con contributing factor to that? So a, a lot of what we're seeing is uh, these things are, are um, related to uh, social events, and, and a lot of them are actually family gatherings more than anything else in these cases that we're seeing. People getting together with family and friends and, and having close contact, and then, you know, you feel comfortable with a group of, with a certain group of people, and one person has it, and then all of a sudden uh, you've had close contact with six or seven people, and then those six or seven people have it. So we are seeing a lot of the... Um, transmission in that in that age group and the the other the other thing that uh, that to, to talk about is a lot of the, a lot of these folks in that age group they they tend to work um, service jobs and and also are attending college so that could also be another factor that's driving that age group but it's it's all it's you know honestly it's conjecture on my point on my part but uh you know I think any of these things could be contributing to it I mean, the timing of that and the, and the big bumps in that age group coincides with, you know, college starting back up and, and could potentially be driven by McDaniel College. And that's kind of, the, kind of consistent with the effect that you were talking about, right, where you open stuff up, you get a bubble, and then you manage the bubble down, right? And, and so right. that's something that we should expect if and when we, we open up the schools to a hybrid model, that there's going to be a bit of a bubble early on and we're gonna manage it down through contact tracing with the local health department in the same way. Right, Ed? Yes, and, and I, I, do wanna, I do wanna mention with McDaniel, what we tried to do just to kind of make the numbers right. When they first reported to school, uh, they tested all the students coming in and we didn't count any of those cases as Carroll County cases when they first got here. After the students had been here for 14 days, we started trying to make sure that if they were using the college address because those folks are here in our community and whatnot. So um, just to let you know that that bubble when they first tested uh, really didn't get counted into our cases. But now now that they're here and they're and we are seeing cases in that community, um, they, they are being counted here as Carroll County cases. Um, one thing that I ne neglected the lead, the uh, thing to mention to you all, and, and I'm not trying to change any of the metrics we're looking at, but I do think that it's important to know, and I'm gonna throw another slide into the uh, presentation when I send it to you next week, is we're starting to see uh, a lot of folks that are that are getting uh, what we call rapid antigen tests, and then they're not getting a PCR test. And, and neither the state nor the health department are counting those, we're, we're, we're contact tracing those, and we're considering those people to be probable cases, but none of those are being counted in our confirmed cases. And it concerned me today, and I just wanted to mention this, and I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't want it to sway necessarily your decision. I just think you need to be aware of it. We had uh, five of these cases show up today that, that, uh, that essentially don't count in our case count. So if we, if we see more and more of these uh, tests being done and people not getting the, uh, the PCR test, we may have to have more discussion about this, but I, I just, Wanted to throw that out there so that you were aware people who are getting rapid antigen tests because of uh, the variability of the test, those are not necessary. Those, those are not being counted in the state or the county um, numbers for, for cases. I, I have a few questions. Um, one, just more of a comment to make sure I understand the, the ICU beds are up slightly, but none of them are COVID, correct? But it's still a concern. You want capacity there, but, but I just wanted to make sure none of them were COVID. Well, uh, I'm, some of, I, I don't have that data in front of me and I, I could have gotten that from Garrett before I came on. I'm sure some of them are COVID. We okay. actually had a COVID death where the person died in the, in the hospital this week. So, okay. so um, some of them are, but not all of them are. And, and I don't have the breakdown, unfortunately. I, I didn't ask Garrett for that before I came on the call tonight. Okay, that, but yeah, that, that explains it to me better. Um, 
I've got a question on timing and to preface it, which I'll probably have to deny to friends later. If, if I were king of the world, I'd want us to open up hybrid as soon as possible. I'd want us to follow that up, which may be a pie in the sky, to open up fully as soon as possible. And then I, I, your point's well taken. Some of the extracurriculars, as much as I love them, they're the next priority. They, we, we, we don't want to risk that. Your, your experience, based on uh, McDaniel College kids showing up, based on stuff you talk with other, others, the, the, the spike in age groups, what kind of timing? Uh, we open up a hybrid October 19th. By mid-November, are we, do we got a good feel? And then, and then along with that question, the timing, once we open, should there be different things we track? And I'm not sure, like cases in the schools, you know, what some of the stuff we can't put out to the public and you can't put out to us some of your tracking stuff, but some, should we track some different stuff once the schools are open? And, and what's that going to tell us? And, uh, and, and what do you think, a month or, or that's not long enough? Well, I, honestly, with, I think it took about, you're right, about a month for, for things to, once, once the kids got back on campus at McDaniel, it, it's going to be, there, there's two things that really are going to happen that when, when you guys go back to school, regardless of whether, when it is, whether it's October or whether it's January or whatever you all decide, the, the thing that's going to happen is one, you're going to, you're going to come back and you're going to have some cases and we're going to have to figure out how to manage them. But it's also just going to be uh, working out those interactions between your staff and, and, and us on, on how to, how to manage this initial uh, group of cases and, and get, get them, get people into isolation and quarantine quickly so that uh, we have a, a smooth rhythm as things, things are uh, moving along. And, and um, you know, it was uh, a little, little, I'll be honest, it was a little bumpy at first for us with, with McDaniel as we were working on these cases. And we're going to find things aren't perfect because we developed this system and we think we've we've accounted for everything. And, and uh, we do have a good working relationship and we'll make phone calls and we'll figure it all out. But not everything's going to work exactly the way that we expect it to do, expect it to be the first week. And, and I, I think probably a month would be a, a, a good measuring stick to see how things have settled out once once you've gone back to school, and I, and I think that that's the time where you, where you can start having further discussions about what's next. Um, but uh, you know, and the things we're going to be wanting to look at is is you know how many cases we've had in in the that are associated with the schools and how many kids we've had to keep out of school because of quarantine and isolation. And I'm not sure statistically how exactly we put that together, but it, it absolutely. Um, you know, from an operational standpoint, how it's impacting your ability to deliver education to the kids, in, in addition to uh, the public health aspects of the school being open, are important to your decisions as to, to where we can go with this next. And and then, and, and this is, uh, I mean, I'd love to know this too, but I get concerned for, for staff, for teachers, and even parents and kids. It seems like um, you see now a lot of wording social on your chart social distancing to the largest extent possible <laughs> and and i think um and i've heard you talk about when contact tracing the 15 minutes and within a certain distance but um I, i'm just worried that uh um somebody's going to walk around the school with a with a little measuring stick and say oh you know you're five and a half feet i'm sorry you know and, and blah what's what's your opinion on what what does that mean to the largest extent possible well, well, first of all, none of this is an exact science. So six feet is, is, is the uh, best science that we've got available based on what CDC's looked at and World Health Organization and other organizations. But um, to the extent possible, we know as you guys are moving back into school in a, in a hybrid model, uh, I'll just throw the example out there. My wife said to me, she said, you know, I might have 30 kids in a class, but when you break it down by the alphabet, Maybe 18 of them come on Monday and Tuesday, and uh, and I've only got 12 on on Thursday and Friday. And and from a practical standpoint, you know that that's going to happen. And you know maybe because you got 18 kids in the class on Monday and Tuesday, there's going to have to be five feet or, or or so between the desk instead of six that day because that's 
what it takes to fit the kids in the class that way. And it's just from a practical standpoint, that's there, there's an understanding that, you know, that, that it's that, that there's an operational issue that you all have to deal with in running a school system. And while we prefer to have six feet everywhere that we can, it's not always going to be possible. Now, what that means to you is if you have, uh, you know, essentially have a have a kid sitting within less than six feet of another kid in class and one of them becomes COVID positive, it's possible that, you know, the person sitting in front of them and the person sitting behind them or the person sitting next to them might have to go in quarantine. Ideally, if you could get six feet all the way around and none of the kids are ever closer than six feet apart for 15 minutes, nobody would ever have to be quarantined. But we, we realize, and I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of thought that's gone into all this and, and CDC's considerations and mm-hmm. recommendations and the state's recommendations to school systems is that uh, you have to look at it, at, at it from a practical perspective. And, you know, I, I know the, the hybrid model, I, I heard people talking tonight, that's not going to be an easy thing for folks to pull off. But, you know, if you don't eventually start putting some of the kids back in the classroom, the question is, is when do you start putting kids back in the classroom? And, um, you know, a lot of it has to do with what level of risk we're, we're willing to take and, and, um, and, and things of that nature. So, you know, I, I think there's a, a very tough balancing act that we're all, regardless, you know, I, I've been telling people all along, regardless of what decision I make right now, there are people far on one side who want everything to be perfectly safe. And there are people far on the other side that want everything fully opened up. And, and neither of those are practical and, and whatever decision you guys make and whatever recommendations I give you, everybody's going to be mad at us because we're not going to be on either of those two extremes. And, 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 you know, it's just the responsible thing to do is to take all these things into consideration and make the best decision that you can. Ed, um, I know we have private schools that are open with students in them. Have we had any cases or problems with them? So... At, at this point, we've, we've, we've had cases, but we, we've, we've not had any large outbreaks or any types of closures or anything of that nature at, at this point in Carroll County. There have been in other jurisdiction, jurisdictions in Maryland, but at this point, we've not, we've not had any outbreaks where we've had to have, have, a, uh, have, have a school significantly change their plans. And some schools are doing different things. Some are in person, some are hybrid, some are or are some are even virtual, even in the private schools. So, so far, uh, so good there. And and you know, I've been really pleased with uh, with where we are with McDaniel. The fact that they've been able to go back. Most most other colleges have, have sent a large number of their students home and gone back pretty much virtually. And and I think a lot of it has to do with the relationship between the health department and and McDaniel. And, and I think a lot of it, whether we're going to be successful or not. And, and getting kids back in the classroom and staying open is going to have to do with that relationship between the health department and your your staff that, that work for the uh, for the education system and, and trying to make sure we manage this. And, you know, the, the most important thing, I think, is, you know, you go back to that CDC chart where I was talking about those those mitigation factors that we put into place. The, the better we are with putting those mitigation factors into place, those five things we talked about, yeah, thanks for putting it back up there. But the better we are in, in, in enforcing those rules and following those rules, the less people we're, we're going to potentially have to keep out of school and in quarantine for two weeks at a time because they're not going to have had close contact and they're not going to have uh, been exposed to somebody that might potentially have COVID. And Ed, so, I will say something that you hit right on the head and is very true. Carroll County Public Schools has worked very hard with the with the health department and vice versa from the opioid epidemic, you know, drug drug problems. And now we're working hand in hand and every county does not do that. We're way ahead of everybody else with working together and uh, and tapping on each other's uh, quality. So and I think that's a plus. So thank you. It is. Yeah, and I'd like to echo that. I mean, I really appreciate all the effort and the the cooperation that you've provided, Ed. It's been invaluable. And I, I know that, y- you know, you helped us put the early on, there was no guidance from the state level. There was no real guidance, um, no feasible guidance from the CDC. And you helped us put metrics together 
that we could stand behind for lack of guidance anywhere else. And no one else had done that. And no one else had done that. And, and we, we were really ahead of the game from that perspective. Mm -hmm. And now that we're seeing the, the guidance come out at the state level, it's too bad that they waited until schools were basically opening um, you know, within the week to provide that. But now there is state guidance coming out. There is the federal guidance coming out from the CDC. And I think that we're, we're reasonably consistent with the guidance that we're seeing come out from those, right? Like, so our numbers right now look pretty green. Of course, you know, so they're, they're, you know, you might call them yellow for us right now um, for our local metrics, but they're trending in the right direction. And, you know, you had said that in the last four days, we only have 16 cases. So we're on pace to hit our criteria um, potentially this week. So we're in kind of what I would call a yellow for local. We're in green for the state. And we're in, it looks like, you know, yellow for for the, the CDC guidelines. And, and Ed, you had said that you think that yellow at the CDC level, that moderate risk is a reasonable place to be to open up in a hybrid fashion, right? Right, I, I, I did say that. Um, I would let you know that we, we are actually in that orange area. If you're looking at the CDC chart where it's higher risk of transmission, but they're looking at the, the past 14 days. And if we could continue to uh, trend downward, we'll easily be in that, that yellow zone. If we, if we, if we keep, if things keep moving in this direction, I, I don't know of anything that the state has planned. You know, the, the governor announced last, last week that we were moving to 75% occupancy on restaurants. I'll be honest with you, I, I it it really didn't do much for any of the, the uh, food facilities in our county. It didn't change anything because they still got to be six feet apart and they can still only use every other booth. So we haven't crowded the bars or restaurants any more than they were before. So, so nothing's really changed. And if we, uh, like I said, every time we reopen something, we create a new bubble. I, I don't see anything on the horizon other than the schools at this point. So if the trend keeps moving in the right direction, I, I can't promise you where we're going to be middle of October, but, you know, considering we've only had 16 cases so far this week and, and we're four days into the week and we've got three more days to go, I would hope that that would be right in line with where we want it to be um, moving into potentially reopening schools. Right. And, and to your question, Mr. Kyler, earlier when you said, you know, what is you know, when, when can we get to a full reopening? And honestly, so like you said, Mr. Singer, when we open something, we get the bubble and you manage the bubble down, right? So we have to open in a hybrid fashion, manage the, experience the bubble, manage it down, and then we can start thinking about the full reopening as being the next step, right? But I don't think we can get to a full without taking that interim step of the hybrid. And as, as well, much and, as and the other thing you need to realize is there there is state guidance from the Maryland State Department of Education and the Maryland Department of Health that they expect you to follow. I'm enforcing that guidance with the uh, with the private schools that are out there now. I mean, there, there's no way I'm letting you put two feet between kids and desks <laughs> in a classroom. And that's what mm -hmm. you need to do to, to, to bring everybody back fully. So until that guidance changes and, and, and we're we're willing to. Uh, to change the the uh, mitigation factors that we have in place y you guys don't really have the ability to move forward because you know we, we wouldn't be meeting the, uh, the the guidance of the Department of Health or, or the Department of e Education at the state level so so you need to realize your, your hands are a little bit tied with that you know I, I know it's going to be much more difficult for you operationally going back in a hybrid model I just don't know what, what other option you have at this point and and I think um again, and they've all said it too, the cooperation between Dr. Lockhart and you and the rest of the staff here and you, I've, and, and I said the other day, again, I'm from construction, not education. You guys have protocols for everything. I, I am very comfortable that, that the situation inside the schools is gonna be the best possible situation. And you, you guys have already talked about contract, contact tracing and how you're gonna handle cases and, and uh, I, I mean, and everybody knows this, but I, I just think we need to try it and, and hopefully everything falls in place and it works, but it, it, it's a little scary. And, and uh, I know talking to different businesses and I know how it was, our office probably 150 people. It, it was a few weeks in the beginning that people were so hesitant. And then it was like, 
oh my gosh, you know, this is kind of working. And, and uh, I think that's what it's going to take here. And, and hopefully, hopefully that's how it works out. But, but you, you got to kind of learn, you know. Mr. Singer, again, I just wanted to, th to thank you so much. I, you know, Ms. Herbert brought up uh, the private schools. I wasn't going to ask about that. Um, I actually have a friend of mine whose kids are in, private, in a private school here in Carroll County, and she's saying that they haven't had any issues, um, that her school seems to be fine, and that they're following all the protocols. Um, and they are what they are considered at capacity right now, and they were never before. Um, but they, they're making it work, and everything has been working out really good. Um, the interesting thing you brought up, Mr. Singer, was regarding McDaniel College and how they've handled COVID. And the funny thing was today, actually, the Senate hearing was interviewing Dr. Fauci, and he had said the problem with a lot of the colleges is they were sending the kids back home. McDaniel did not do that. McDaniel um, was keeping the children there, or the students there, in another area. And I think that's something that, that McDaniel College definitely needs, like, a high five one, because that was the best scenario to do um, instead of spreading it so they kept it contained so I think that's uh, that's incredible and speaks to what our health department's been working on here in the county I'm just kind of laughing because the discussion we had in the beginning was well if the kids get sick we can just send them back home I was like you know what you do to the families if you do that <laughs> and they got it really quick it was because you, you send a kid home who's sick from college then you've got the whole family in quarantine and mom and dad can't go to work and you know this could go on for for weeks in their house while 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 it gets spread around to other people so mm -hmm. you know they've done a really good job in, in in isolating and quarantining people and keeping them there and we can't keep people from going home if 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 they want to but uh you know we try to explain to them why it's beneficial just to stay in place it's a relatively short period of time to get through it and most young people are okay with it and and uh so uh, I, I just think you got to look at how, how, how these things can be managed. So I guess board members, any other questions for Mr. Singer? I, I think that, you know, with the, the statement of, you know, we there was a bubble that happened with some of the additional opening, you know, several weeks ago. We've managed that. It looks like the health department has been managing that bubble down. We're, we're on pace to get close to um, our metrics uh, within the next several weeks. And I, I think that this is all good news in terms of us being able to, to stick with our, our current plan. I'd and I think, and I think um, I'm, I'm up in Pennsylvania. One of the problems they did early on, they wanted these fixed numbers. And, and like Southwest had to close for a week because they, they said, if we have three cases, we're fine. We're going to do this, do this. We have four. It's like drop dead. Um, one of the elementary schools in Gettysburg, they had two cases and they closed the school because they said if they have more than one case, they're going to close. Well, now those boards are trying to come up with a better, more flexible plan. And, and so I'm so glad you haven't, you know, sat here and said, you know, like whatever, four cases and you need to close this building and do whatever. You got to, it, it's, it's, it's a science, but it's not an exact number science. And, and I think, uh, I, you know, like looking at all these metrics, I, I love these charts. And, and you know, when, when you see a whole lot of green, it, it tells you things are getting better. And, and if you're right, the next time we meet, uh, our community cases may even be in the green. And I think that's a, a very aggressive, that three is a very aggressive number. And I, I just, I hope Carroll County can maintain it. I mean, that, that'll be super. So again, thanks for the, the way you've developed this criteria. So Mr. Singer, in moderate transmission, how many cases are expected per day? So I, I kind of, can we go back to that slide? Yeah, because uh, I, I actually did a calculation on that. So the calculation that I did was, was talking about in, in moderate transmission, the maximum number of cases we would want to see in a two week period would be 84. So we got to do the math here. And so divide 84 by 14, and that gives you your, your cases per day that we want to be seeing. So I, um, 
you know, I used to be able to do math in my head, but let me do this real quick. Mr. And, uh, and I are breaking out our calculators. Yeah, today. Today. <laughs> we got to a nice even Six. number. So we want, we want an average of less than six cases per day over a two week period or less than 84 total cases um, in Carroll County. Uh, and that includes the facility cases, but we've, we've seen very few facility cases recently. They've only been one or two, maybe a week. So they're, they're having little impact on our numbers right now, but uh, less than 84 total cases over a two week period is what the CDC says puts you in the uh, moderate risk range. And also, I just think that we need to keep in mind that if a bubble does develop in the schools, then there will be, of course, the uptick in cases. And then these are the health of the students and teachers that is at stake. And at times, the virus can cause some debilitating um, conditions to um, people. So I just think we need to keep in mind that um, big risks that's still there in the hybrid model with the uptick that will, we know will happen. Yep, and, and, and as I said, there's, there's uh, thank, thanks for, the, as I said earlier, the, the regardless of what we do, um, you know, until this pandemic's over and we're, we're more than a year or so, I, I'd say probably a year and a half, two years for this thing completely being behind us. Until this pandemic's over, there's no such thing as no risk. And, and that's that's where where you get into the difficulty of what's an acceptable risk and and uh, you know there's there there are no no risk scenarios in this situation. <clears throat> All right, Ed, if we, we've uh, we've let you off the hook the last few meetings, but I'm hoping you can stay around a little bit because <laughs> we do have a few more related conversations. Um, first, we think it's important that our community understands. Um, how we respond uh, when we do have COVID cases in, in, in our in our schools, as well as how we intend to communicate that. And so I know John and Carl are going to get into that, but it's been a great partnership so far as we've navigated that. And uh, I'd like to uh, turn it over to, to John and Carl to have that conversation. And Ed, we'd appreciate your, uh, if you're able to hang out a little bit longer with us. Yeah, I, I could stick around a little longer. I'm not staying till midnight or whenever you guys go back. In the <laughs> Hopefully we won't either, Mr. We, we aren't either tonight, right? Right. Yep. <laughs> so, and, and Dr. Lockard, this, this whole discussion is based on a lot of questions um, and confusion, right, that, that we've been seeing from community members, right, trying to understand what the decision tree is, you know, as you... Right. as you do the contact tracing, what the protocol is going to be in the schools when we see... Uh, when we know of a particular positive case, right? Like what is, what is the, or if you have symptoms, what is the, what is the path? And so there, there's been so much noise in the community of not understanding what those paths are um, that we wanted to, to put this sort of grid together to, to ease everyone's minds a little bit. Right. I mean, I, I don't know that I've heard tremendous noise about it, but I think we want to articulate very clearly, here's what you can expect. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we want to be transparent and and uh, making sure we're communicating with everybody who needs to be communicated with. We also have to respect and adhere to um, privacy of uh, individuals and students. Um, so we want to make sure that that folks understand how we would go about doing that. So, mm -hmm. and I think your point's great on the. I think we need to educate everybody, and, and I'm not sure I know completely on what you're not allowed to tell them because right away you're not being transparent you're hiding something well no i'm sorry it's the law you know and and we don't want to make things worse we want to make them better you know and i think that's an important part of this can, can i address that uh that piece there if you if you don't mind just on what we can and and, and can't share from a health standpoint or do you want to move on with the presentation then we can talk about that later it's in the presentation, Mr. Singer, if, if you are hanging on, but if you're not, yep. then I would say address it now. Well, no, I, I was just thinking in, in, in general terms, I, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, we do have the, generally there's there's uh, privacy information that's uh, uh, related to health that, that, that is always in place. There are certain times where the health department in, in, in a pandemic like this can waive that privacy information 
but it's only if it's going to make an impact on, on, on preventing the spread of disease. Just because people want to know doesn't mean that they get to know that, you know, a certain person had, had, the, had the disease. And I think that's the important piece to know. When we're doing our contact tracing, those people who need to know and need to isolate, need to quarantine, and potentially have been exposed are going to know about it. But other people who haven't been exposed, it, 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 they're just, well, I'll just put it the way that it is. They're just being nosy, and it's really not their, their <laughs> business as to whether or not a specific person had it or not. I hear keep hearing all the time that we want to know where it is and who had it and that type of thing. And that's, you know, we've, we've got to balance a, a, a person's right to privacy that they've had it with, with the uh, protecting public and the, and the public health and your students and your staff. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that and we'll see see where the presentation takes. Great. So thank you, Doc, or Mr. Singer, Dr. Lockhart and, and board members. Um, I think you framed this discussion already very well, so I won't try to, try to do more. Uh, the only thing I'd add, President Savigny, is that one of the one of the very specific things, I don't think my slide is moving. One of the very specific things that was also discussed at the last board meeting in this in this context was, is there some sort of a visual um, one page flow chart or decision tree or something like that, that, that uh, we could share publicly in this forum and that people in, in general, employees, parents, public could have access to. And, and there is, and you now have that in your packet. And it's also part of this, um, this presentation section. And, um, you know, it's great that Mr. Singer can stay on because this really, a lot of things he said gets right into sort of the real world. How does this work? And and we ha we've had some students in, we haven't had a lot of students in yet, um, but we have had employees in the whole time. And so we've, we've had limited examples of, of following the exposure protocol. And now we want to take a few minutes and use that visual device to, um, to give you a much more detailed glimpse into how that works. Um, there are some general guidelines in our plan document itself. Um, I think the collaboration with Mr. Singer and his team have been, has been discussed pretty thoroughly at this point. We have lots of operational procedures. I think Mr. Kyler just mentioned that all sorts of protocols in place with the health department and um, responsibilities assigned and, and, and all of those types of things. Um, but all of those protocols and procedures in general are based on uh, something that is a one page flow chart from the developed collaboratively between the Maryland Department of Health and the Maryland State Department of Education that's called their decision aid on what happens when an employee or a student uh, has an exposure. And so, uh, President Sivigny, I think you made that distinction early as well. It's not only if there's a positive case, it's not only if uh, somebody tests positive, it's also about the symptoms that people might be exhibiting and what do we have to do and what do we do when uh, when those symptoms arise among employees or, or eventually students. And so, um, we wanted to use that MDH and MSDE decision aid as a way to refer you through that process and we're actually going to have mr streaker take over and and um and lead that discussion he's he's a more direct point of contact for our for our system between the health department and the schools and and uh also ms gomes and and the uh, student health services function uh reports up through his ranks as well and so he has oversight of that and the way this PowerPoint lays out now, as Carl starts to walk you through that, we took what is a one-page document, and I know you have that one-page document, but we broke it into sections. Uh, we, we took the pieces of the chart and broke them out here for the sake of putting them in a PowerPoint. I can flip through them that way as Carl talks you through, or I could go and display the PDF uh, decision chart if that's more, more convenient. So I'll leave that up to you you, the board, and, and Carl, as he steps you through what happens when there are symptoms or exposures. Thank you, John. I appreciate the, uh, the intro. And I do think it's easier to, as we break it down, to go uh, the way we've got it set up because the slides, one at a time, uh, kind of do a nice job breaking down the different pieces. So the slide deck now, I think what we have up is the, uh, the decision aid. Um, and I think the first thing that this is trying to capture is you know, what the, the, to define what is a COVID-like illness? What what does it mean to have COVID-19? And and we have um, tried to be proactive and communicate. We've actually tweaked our communication that's going out weekly. We'll be sending that out uh, each Friday uh, with a, with adding some clarity as we keep sending things out that 
we basically don't want kids to come to school if they're sick. Regardless if they have one symptom or two symptoms, we don't want them to come to school. And in our initial thought, we spent a lot of time making sure it was COVID related. Um, so we've made a distinction in an upcoming uh, communication of, that'll go out Friday that differentiates that and I think provide, provide some clarity. So um, the first piece is what is what is it to be COVID-like or to have an illness? And, and as it describes there on the, the top of the decision tree, uh, which is broken down in just this box here, um, for any COVID-like illness, it's one of the following. So you meet one, I kind of, when I'm explaining this to large groups, I kind of say, it's like the lunch menu. You have a pick one and you have a pick two. I think that's something a lot of people uh, can follow pretty easily. So if you have a pick one list, um, if you have a cough, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or new loss of taste or smell, any one of those things um, means that you have a COVID-like illness from a symptom perspective. Uh, we have worked closely with Dr. Taylor, uh, with the health department to talk about that and make sure that our uh, nursing staff is up to speed on the clinical nature of those pieces. And I will tell you, this is effective. This came out August the 28th. Um, these things change. The symptoms move from one to the other as uh, the epidemiology changes. We learn more things. Um, these pieces are fluid. So um, I don't know if it's a monthly piece or just as new information changes, but this was updated August 28th which was quite a bit different than what it was. There's a, some nuance changes um, from what, what was originally published. And then the pick two menu um, means we have two of the following, a fever of 100 degrees, 100.4 or higher, uh, chills, shaking chills, muscle aches, sore throat, headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, and congestion or runny nose. And essentially, that two of those symptoms would mean that you meet the criteria for a potential COVID um, symptomatic that you have potential of COVID. Um, so that's what drives our decision is looking at those pieces. So we can go to the next slide. Before you go on, Mr. Streaker, can I just mention, I've heard um, talk as well about a rash. Um, any chance that that too may eventually be included or? I'm not aware of that, Ms. Dorsey. Okay. And, and uh, the guidance is directly from Maryland Department of Health. Um, Mr. Singer, I don't know if you've heard anything about that. I have, while I've heard that, it's not made its way into this guidance document from Maryland Department of Health. Yeah, I, I don't think that it's, and um, I, I don't want to get too much into this because I've only read a little bit on it, but these, these are the symptoms that we're looking for to, to know whether somebody could potentially be actively transmitting the disease. I think the rash is something that, that is developing later in in late, later in, in stages in the disease, and, and I, I've heard about that, but I, I think that, uh, you know, that th this does, I, I'm telling you, this is a pretty broad um, bunch of uh, symptoms to start with, and, and I, I don't, it, it is based on the CDC guidance. I don't think the rash is necessarily something that we need to add to this because, and that may just add some, some more confusion to things because there are a lot of other reasons that kids get rashes and things of that nature. And I think we're going to catch 99% of the of anybody that's symptomatic with this group of symptoms. And we're going to catch a lot of people who really don't have COVID-19 that we're going to have to rule that out for before we send them back to school. So I would think the, the, the rash thing is not something I think is likely is going to be included in any guidance from CDC or the Department of Health. But it is something that some people have developed as part of their uh, disease progression with COVID. And I'm just looking at the um, the fever. So again, if I don't have a thermometer, um, but I really feel like I, I have a fever, um, so that too would count. That would be my um, subjective take on having a fever. That's correct. I feel like I have one. Yes, Dr. Dorsey. And, and just while we bring up fever, um, the COVID uh, criteria, when, it, when we talked about the actual temperatures, 100.4, we had some discussions, Mr. Singer, uh, was part of with Dr. Taylor in our initial communication about we've we've always had the practice of a student with a fever of 100 degrees to not send. And we didn't want to send communication that made it look like it was OK to be at 100.4. Um, and actually, since then, some feedback we've received from the community is that our weekly communication now had a little bit of confusion about are you saying it's OK to send if your uh, child to school if they have chills or shaking chills because it's only one. and. And so we've modified that guidance, um, as I kind of talked about earlier, to, to try to be as clear as possible to families that 
the, the primary goal we have is if your child is sick and as an employee, if you're sick, stay home. That's a very, very important part of controlling the spread of this disease and any other disease, quite frankly. Okay, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. I did it. So this is the, um, I'm gonna make sure I'm the right one. So um, the next part of this is um, a, a person who has one symptom. So this is defining a person who has one symptom as like kind of, look, a student has diarrhea or a fever, which is not on the PIC2, and is on the PIC2, but they have one of these symptoms. These are symptoms we don't want students in school if they have these symptoms. And there are other pieces that come into play. COVID isn't the only communicable disease or only sickness that we want, you know, to keep out of schools and make sure students and, and staff are healthy. So what this slide is getting into in the decision tree, again, it's at the top. Um, and again, these are more broad and they're laying out the, the topics. For a long, long time, we've been following if a student has a fever that they have to stay home for 24 hours without fever reducing medicine. And folks, we know, and I just wanna take this opportunity to say to the public, you know, please don't give your kid ibuprofen at 6 a.m. and pray they make it through the day, uh, because when that wears off at noon, we're gonna be calling you and and spinning up potentially a, a COVID type thing, and, and you're putting everybody at risk. So please, if you're not feeling well, Please keep your child home. Um, we we do seriously mean, and it's always been a longstanding practice that that fever free is without fever reducing medication. So the, the ibuprofen I know helps us um, cope through those symptoms, but it's not going to help us in the communicable disease side of things as we move forward. So there are other communicable diseases, chicken pox, for example, that um, will make at times, you know, come into school. So there's other pieces that these single symptoms can be indications uh, that we have another symptom going on. And that's what that link is uh, pointing out there, the communicable disease summary that's longstanding practice of different things um, that we respond to in school. So non-COVID related, but still diseases that we're, we're definitely have an eye on and we work through as, as symptoms come up that arise to that occasion. And so again, the first part of this is just we also what is COVID? I'm sorry, Ms. Herbert. Uh, we also have uh, another thing coming up, and that'll be flu season. So then that's going to be another thing on top of, of, of what goes on with everything else with COVID. So, uh, and they have very similar symptoms. Yes, yes. Uh, Ms. Herbert, that's oh. one of the biggest challenges yes. is the parallel nature of the symptoms between flu and COVID, um, you know, definitely creates a challenge. Uh, and. And what we're optimistic of is if we're following this guidance and following the places that we will have less uh, less flu spread throughout the schools and the community, um, you know, as we have students interact, and that that would be a, a positive. But we'll certainly have students come in with flu; it, it can come on pretty pretty sharply. Um, and and I think the having the virtual option now too would help with that because a lot of it had to do with students they didn't want to miss the schoolwork and then have to make up all the schoolwork. So I think having that virtual option now, um, you know, depending upon if they want to do hybrid or not, that helps with things as well, too. I mean, I, to me, that I think that would definitely help keep cases down with any illness going into the schools. Okay, go ahead and I'm sorry. Let me just chime in for one quick second to uh, tag on to what Ms. Pataglia said. That's a very good point for a lot of reasons. Um, one is, look, you know, I've worked in, in schools for over 25 years, and I know sometimes kids are coming to school with, with symptoms. I'm imploring our, our parents to support, um, and that we'll, we'll, we're going to nag you with these reminders all the time about all these symptoms because we want this to work, mm -hmm. right? And so in order for it to work, you've heard Ed Singer say this time and time again, it's gonna take lots of people doing all the right things to, tr to try to make it happen. But to your point, um, you can still get the instruction, even if you're just, you, you know, you're not feeling that great, you feel like, oh, I could be there. Well, you can, you're still gonna be able to get it virtually. Um, that's still gonna be an option for you. Um, and so we're going to implore people, don't take the chance. Um, you can still, if you're, you know, if you're sick, sick, then by all means, you know, get well, get better, rest up, et cetera. But if you're just not sure, 
and we don't want you coming in because you're exhibiting a couple of those symptoms which are still, you can, you can get it virtually. Um, and then we know for sure, then you're better and you're back, but you're not missing instruction. And, and Mr. Streaker, I'm not changing the subject, but I do, well, that's what, when we bring up the flu, we are gonna get information out to parents about a flu vac, uh, something coming on. So I think they all need to know that too, whenever that happens, so. So I, if, if you want me to share a flu, I can tell you we're doing flu vaccines coming up here on the 20th. Uh, the plan right now is the 21st and 28th of October. Uh, we're going to be trying, uh, working with the Maryland Partnership for Prevention. We'll be doing those on Wednesdays at six of our schools from 3 to 6 p.m. So information is going to be coming out. We're just, we literally, I, I spoke to Ms. Gomes today. She was uh, finalizing some things there. We actually open to the community for, for children the age of six months to 18 years. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that we're going to be doing is using our, what are called identified as our pod schools, which are designated emergency preparedness sites, um, so that we can, and, and those are designated by the department of emergency management, um, that should there ever be a case where we needed to, um, do a mass vaccination for whatever reason, we decided, uh, in partnership with them, that this would be a good time to go ahead and, and practice, uh, that, that. You know, the use of the facilities and I believe they're planning to do a drive through but more information to come Ms. Herbert but certainly we are working on getting the flu vaccine out thank well, you thank you because my doctor asked me when I was getting my flu shot what what's going on with Carroll County Public Schools and then I got a hold of Dr. Lockhart so that way everybody knows what's going on thank you they need no to know all right so we'll move on to the next oh it's already there I'm sorry I'm looking at a different screen here so so now we get into a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of the um of the decision aid so and i want to be clear and this is what's nice about the way we've broken it down here this evening for the board to kind of look at it um an asymptomatic person uh that's the first line so somebody who has no symptoms at all uh who tests positive so the top left line there is reading um and, and we're having that i mean uh, mr singer spoke about that with the college as they're doing some screening so an asymptomatic person who has no no symptoms whatnot um yeah, test positive, then that student should stay home for 10 days. And this is students and staff. The person stays home for 10 days from the date of the positive test. That's the clinical guidance there. And then we get into close contacts. And I think this is where um, some of the increased challenges lie. A close contact should stay home for 14 days from the date of the exposure, even if they have no symptoms or have a negative COVID test. So if someone's a close contact, which is currently defined by being less than six feet for 15 minutes or longer, um, that person's a close contact. And some of the confusion has come up as we've worked through these. People have said, but I got a negative COVID test. I'm a close contact and I got a negative test. That does not release you from that possibility because the symptoms take time to develop. So through the, through the decision guidance from MDH and MSDE, that's where that box is coming in. A close contact, uh, again, six feet, 15 minutes, um, they need to stay home if they're a close contact of a positive asymptomatic person. Um, any questions about the asymptomatic positive test? Okay, then we'll move on to the, the next large yellow box. Uh, a person, so basically anyone with, with COVID-like illness. And that goes back to the first thing we discussed. Anybody on the pick one list or the pick two list to just give you the perspective of the symptoms. Um, that person's to be excluded. Um, so meaning we send the student home or the employee home um, and recommend they talk to their healthcare provider about getting a test um, and or to see if they have a different specific diagnosis. Uh, they could test positive for flu. They could have something else. So that's one of the reasons that the contacting your healthcare provider is a good idea. They need to isolate um, waiting for the test results and then the close contacts need to quarantine. So if you're a close contact of a person, you go into quarantine as well. Um, and then following through breaks it down a little bit of what, what are the things that happen after I have symptoms? And that's the next section. If I have symptoms, I, I could end up getting a positive test, right? So I had symptoms, I went and got my test and I'm positive. That's the first line. If I'm positive, we follow the same guidance as if I'm asymptomatic and I'm positive. And I stay home for 10 days from the day sy uh, symptoms appear. And then I need to make sure, again, that fever-free for 24 hours without fever-reducing medication um, and improvement of other symptoms. So both of those, even if it's after 10 days, I still have to make sure I'm well 
You know, we don't want people coming back so achy and, and having a fever, but it's been beyond 10 days. We want to be clear that that still is very important. Um, and then again, go over the close contact, any close contact of that symptomatic person. Um, and whether they're positive, um, right now, if they're positive, that that's still the same, the same case. The second box below the positive test. So again, the person has symptoms, what else could happen? We have people that, um, they don't receive a laboratory test or another uh, specific diagnosis. So they, they, maybe we have a family who says, I, I'm not going to go get tested. We could have that situation. Um, or they don't come up with a different diagnosis, like saying, well, that person has the flu or some other test or strep or something. Well, if they don't receive um, a laboratory test or another specific diagnosis, we're still considering them as a positive case because we don't have anything to say that they're not. So in those cases, they follow the same protocol of staying home for 10 days, making sure they're symptom-free before they return, and close contacts remain in the need of quarantining for 14 days. So that's, that's those two pieces of either positive or not having a test. Does anybody have any questions about that before I move on to the, the next part changes a bit? I think, I, I, oh, go ahead. I just wanna say, I think um, Mr. Singer can probably verify this. Testing is still free at the Ag Center, correct? Yes. Yeah, I yeah and I'm not, I, I can tell you that we have uh, funding and we've got commitment from the Ag Center to be there through the end of the year. So um, I can't tell you what's going to happen. Uh, CARES funding ends uh, December 30th, and I can't tell you what's going to happen after that. But uh, right now, um, one thing that, that I want to make clear to folks is, um, you, you know, the, the important thing is that you get the right kind of test as well. And that is that you want to have a PCR test done. That's what we do at the Ag Center. They are available through private providers, but um, we would not, and, and I've had this discussion with staff at the, at the uh, your staff at the school system already. Uh, if somebody gets a rapid antigen test, and the rapid antigen test is negative. It's not reliable enough to allow the student to return to school. So it's important that they get a PCR test. We're testing Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays in general. And our turnaround time has been uh, 24 hours with the lab that we're using. So that, that's certainly going to be available between now and through the end of uh, December. Uh, we'll have to see what develops after that. Mr. Singer, this is John O'Neill. We did, um, ha having had those conversations with you, we did update all of our guidance internally to reflect the requirement for a PCR test. So, you know, for an example, Ms. Baptist in, in Human Resources, um, she would not be able to return an employee in that case to work uh, unless it's confirmed that the negative test result is from a PCR test. So we have made those updates to the plan and to the to the working protocols. And I think there's some important distinctions here, too, where a lot of parents in the community were worried about, you know, if their kid exhibits any kind of symptom that we're going to be forcing them to race off and, and get a test. And that is clearly not the case, like, through these grids, right? Like, we're, we're basically saying that, you know, we, we might um, recommend that they get tested, but basically they would, we would just be saying, well, you just need to follow the protocol of staying home for at least 10 days. Um, past symptoms. That's right, Ms. Savini. That's that's correct. We would we don't we wouldn't require or force a student to get tested. But I do want to say, in the spirit of of us being able to return and operate efficiently, it is very helpful when people do get the test or see their healthcare provider, um, perhaps, and find out if the student tests positive for strep or uh, flu or something else. Because while that student um, that student usually impacts others. So if that student has any close contacts, what actually allows them, and we'll get to that in just a second, when we have a symptomatic person, when that symptomatic person is tested and is negative, that now lets the students who were quarantined based on that exposure return to school. So you are correct that we would not require any students or families to you know, mandate that they get a test, but from the extent of community health and cooperation, we would highly encourage folks to check with their healthcare providers to see if it perhaps is something else, as well as to get a, a test so that we can, as a whole community, approach that and try to get people back up to speed. 
And, and we also have to recognize that this is beyond the school system. When somebody's in quarantine, you know, I think Mr. Singer would, would agree that when people are in quarantine, we don't want them out and about in the community, going to the grocery store, you know, so the sooner anyone is released from that reality, you know, you, it's, it's a pretty um, sobering experience when, when you're a close contact and then, you know, a lot of fear kicks in and, and everybody's home life, you know, the impact there. So absolutely, we, we cannot and would not require someone, but we certainly would highly encourage them to do so. And I think I'm, that's one reason I'm taking this opportunity now um, to share that, that impact to, to others uh, is certainly significant. Right, and I completely yeah, agree and, with and that. We need I, everybody to do all the right things, right? Uh, and we, we need to all be good community citizens, right? And do the right things when, when your kid has symptoms, um, but I, what I what I was referring to is there were a bunch of, you know, we, we got a lot of emails and things from parents in the community saying, well, you know, if my kid has a runny nose because the mask was causing a runny nose or they sneeze once or twice because, you know, they've got seasonal allergies or something like that, that, you know, they were worried that their kid was going to be raced off and, and forced to take a, a test, right? Like, so I think what this should do is a very, very specific definition of the symptoms and what is a COVID-like illness is very different than those kind of concerns from parents, right? And But now that those very specifically defined and we know, okay, we're gonna strongly encourage you to get that test, um, but we just we all need to do the right things, but we're not gonna be crazy about, you know, when we're pulling kids and saying, oh, they, they have symptoms. It has to fit these very specific definitions of your, your pick one or your pick two um, menus. Exactly. And I think another thing, too, is that also we need to kind of some of the false information that's out in the community, too, that, you know, we're going to test the student ourselves and in the school. No, that's not happening. That is not happening whatsoever because that has been out there. Um, so I think that needs to be said, too. And Mr. Stricker, I do appreciate, um, you know, you bringing up all this information because it is very important for families to understand when it comes to the option of them going hybrid or not. I do want to share, Mr. Singer, I don't know if you want to echo this. One of the, one of the biggest challenges we do see is uh, with, the, with the long list of the symptoms in the picture, the commonness, I'll say, of those symptoms, um, that is certainly a challenge for us um, when we look at the, the, the common exposure, like uh, President Savigny, like you mentioned, you know, we have students that have runny noses and congestion. A lot of these do, they do tend to couple up. So um, those, those challenges are going to be um, experiential for us. And as we get into it and we learn and we communicate with families, um, certainly a lot of learning uh, will take place um, as we work through them. Um, but that does lead us to the next part where we talk about that. Earl, one you, said, uh, you had said if I, I wanted to echo what you were saying, I, I, I will just say from what we've seen in the workplace, and I, I just want to kind of throw this out there because we've had experience with this already because people are back at work, people are back at college and whatnot. There, there are, I'd say, in, in the cases that I've seen, probably 80% of the people that were, were uh, initially having these, these COVID-like um, symptoms and we're, we're trying to make sure that we, we screen people out uh, probably are not positive for COVID. And, and uh, many people... You know, when we talk about a positivity rate of uh, of five percent is what we want in our testing. A lot of these people are these symptomatic people who are being tested, and and uh, so so not necessarily a large percentage of people who have these symptoms are going to have COVID. But but if if we don't rule it out, it does really uh, have an impact on. You know, the, the 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 worst part of it is is when you, when you have other folks that are in quarantine because the only way for if you've been a close contact to me and you had COVID, the only way for me to get out of quarantine is for you to uh, essentially have um, COVID ruled out by a doctor or by a test so that I can so that I can get out of my quarantine. So it's again, it's important that, that we're good citizens and we try to help other folks out and not necessarily have them in, in quarantine by, by, by um, getting COVID ruled out if, if, if that's not really what the person has. Mm -hmm. hey, along with what both of you just said, um, could you explain to me Okay, if I'm in the big box here and I get a negative test, I get rid of my symptoms, I can come back to school. But 
if I'm all the way upright, if I'm a close contact and have no symptoms, a negative test doesn't even let me come back, correct? That's, I that's still got to stay out 14 days. That's correct, Mr. Kyler. If you are a close contact of somebody who's suspected of having COVID, the only way that you get out of quarantine is for or the person that you are a close contact to be to be ruled out, which would be either through a medical diagnosis or a negative PCR test to Mr. Singer's earlier point. So if they uh, get a negative test, I'm OK, but if they're still positive and I'm negative. I stay out the 14 days. Correct. And there's that. And the reason being, and just to make sure everybody understands this, is uh, COVID uh, can have up to a uh, 14 day incubation period. And, and it's been documented that people could get it from the first day to, to, to day 14. It's most common that people are, are developing uh, symptoms between day four and like day seven. But but it is it, it's entirely possible that any time during from from day one to day 14 during a quarantine, that that's when you could become sick. So if the if the other person has COVID or is suspected of having COVID, the only way to get out of the the only way to get out of quarantine is to do the 14 days, and that and that's 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 it. Now now the the state has been recommending that you know day five to the seven maybe uh, that you go ahead and get tested because uh, you may be asymptomatic, and, and we'd want to know that so that we can make sure that. Uh, by the time that we're letting you go back out in the community or go back to school, that you're not potentially infectious to other people. Thanks. Mr. Kyler, I think that leads us really nicely into the green, the green part of the box if, if we're ready to move forward. Um, so so in the, again, where we are is we're talking about asymptomatic folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're talking about folks who have symptoms. Um, so anyone with the, the, the one indicator or the two um, in the next, the, the green box, the first one, person has a negative test for COVID. So the, the student, the staff member was symptomatic. They test COVID, again, a PCR test, not the rapid test, and they're negative. When they're negative, they should still stay home if they have symptoms. Going back to, they could have something else. They could have, you know, they, they may just have a, a really bad cold, a sinus infection, and go down the list of something that somebody might have. So they should stay home until they are well which goes back to like the very the second thing that we talked about with other symptoms. But but when you're well, you are good to go, um, and they should consider being tested for COVID-19 if they don't improve. So if they if it could be something where it lingers on and on. So even if they get a negative test but they don't get better, they should then consult with their healthcare provider to possibly get tested again. But if once they have a negative test, that's where you kind of jump all the way over. Notice where it says close contacts do not need to stay home as long as they remain asymptomatic. So they are released from quarantine once that positive, I mean, that negative test has happened for the symptomatic person. The next part, which is also important and, and why we do think it's important for folks to see their health care providers beyond just the COVID test, is the health care provider can document that the person has another specific diagnosis like flu, strep throat, just a couple examples again from the MDH guidance, um, and they could document that it's from a pre-existing condition. Uh, we do have some procedures and protocols in place as we as a school system communicate with, with doctors uh, when those pieces happen. Um, but if that were to take place, a doctor was to say, you know, we tested the student and they're positive for flu B. I'm just totally making this up. Um, if they're positive for flu B and the doctor says we're sure that it's not COVID, then again, we release the, the uh, students in quarantine, are able to return, but that student should still stay home until they're feeling better. So that's how that part works out. So this is really to describe the steps that happen if an asymptomatic person's positive or if somebody has symptoms and then go through the different scenarios with that. Any questions before we move on to the next slide? Okay. So now the next piece, yeah, make sure we're on the same slide deck. Uh, an asymptomatic person who tests positive for COVID-19 um, should stay home for 10 days uh, from the day of their positive test. That's very similar. You know, I may have misread, and I let me just tell you. Yeah, Carl, no, I, I think this that's just, the same, same. Yeah, it just breaks sorry. down the other slide. Yeah. I just read that part. I'm like, I saw that twice. Yep. Um, <laughs> so I think we can go on to the next slide. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, this actually, these next two slides are the slide I just went over in detail, breaking right. it down further. Break it down, right. um, so these are the piece by piece that we just went over as a group. Yeah. Um, there you go. Any, any questions about that so we're able to move through those parts? Okay. And again, I would just say for the public especially, the, the document exists as a single sheet of paper with a flow chart. It's, it's uh, linked from one of the earlier slides for anyone who wants it. It's, it's easily found if you, um, if you were to sort of Google MDH decision aid uh, flow chart or something like that, you could find it on the MDH site. But um, also this is what, um, so that board members know, I know that Dr. Lockhart and I and others, when we get, when we get questions maybe via email from, from parents or even employees, I've shared the, this chart with um, some of the unions, for instance, when they say, is there some simple one page thing I could look at to help me understand how this works? This is what we have been sending out and saying all of our procedures are, are based on this. Right, and John, thank you for referencing that. And I'll share, um, you know, we, when we, Put our plan together and we certainly made revisions as we went and updates to the plan based on feedback and meetings and input and uh, technical support um, but all of those things whether it was protocols for um, you know the uh, exposures whether it was communication whether it was sanitation procedures all the things we were required to submit um, to msde they they have been officially approved um, and so um, you know, I, I appreciate all the work that's gone into that. And, you know, I know there's a, that plan is a lot. It is loaded with links to lots of things and we're pulling out a few pieces here to share tonight, but a tremendous amount of work and thought has gone into that and a lot of partnership with uh, the, the health department here as well to try to provide some clarity um, and some, some concise communication to folks. So I just wanted to reference the fact that all this has been a part of the planning all along but it's worth a, our time to really explain it and, and go through it in detail so people understand. So, John? Sure, and so the next couple of slides, they're very similar. One addresses employees, one addresses students, so I probably should have put them in the opposite order so Carl could have continued with students, but they're very similar, and, and obviously there's overlaps. If you have students in a classroom with, with, with teachers, with the employee, then there might be you know, the, the opportunity for both an employee and a student to be part of the same exposure. But we wanted to just sort of pull it out and then talk about, okay, when that exposure protocol that Carl has just stepped through and the contact tracing that, that is going on and underneath of it is happening, what kind of communication is going on? Um, I would guess that on any, any week, there's probably not many days in a week ever that occur where somebody from CCPS is not talking to somebody from the health department anyway, but when there's an exposure, symptoms or test, that, that communication ramps up even further. Um, and I don't know if Ed would say manages is the right word. I, could, I was sort of at a loss to come up with the proper word, but the health department is in charge of contact tracing. They, they own that. They're the, they're, the, they're the clinical agency who should be responsible, who should supervise that process, but we do support it. And Carl might want to delve into that more on the student slide where, where, where some of these bullets repeat. So we do collect information for them. It's, it, we try to streamline the process and make it as efficient as possible. And we're better equipped to get people's contact numbers that they may need to dial, um, get a list of people together and, and have some initial discussions with, with those employees to, to try to assist the health department in making some decisions on on who needs to be um, quarantined and maybe even suggested that you that you take a test. Um, we we do as a matter of HR practice let every employee know, hey, you're a you're a close um, contact, so you're going to need to be quarantined, or you have symptoms, so you're going to need to be quarantined. There are human resources procedures in place for all of that. Um, and uh, we do interact all of our protocols at school. And I just want to spend a minute on this uh, because it's not part of the exposure protocol. It's part of a separate piece of CDC guidance that the State Department of Ed incorporated into their requirements for our plans. And so this, this also lives in our plan. It's, but it's not part of the symptoms exposure protocol. It's a separate, uh, it's a separate 
piece of guidance from CDC that deals with cleaning and sanitizing public facilities, community facilities. Um, and so a, another protocol that, that, that lies out there for us is that when there is an exposure, we need to uh, follow the guidance as best we can. It's sort of like social distancing to some degrees to the extent possible. But where there's an exposure, we're going to close that space. And in general, that may be for 48 hours, because the way that it works is you try to s sort of close or, you know, not literally, but seal the space for, for up to the first 24 hours, let it settle, maybe increase ventilation, that sort of thing. And then during the second 24 hours, you, Mr. Prokop gets his crews in there, and that's when we do the, the cleaning and the sanitizing. And then, you know, after that process is complete, that, that space is ready to be used again. So we're not always talking about entire schools by any means. It, 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 it might be a classroom. It might be part of an office. It, 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 wherever the exposure has happened, that's the space that would be closed following that CDC um, and MSDE guidance. So that's that's not in the chart. That's not part of exposure. That's that's a separate um, separate requirement. So I wanted, you know, I wanted to make that clear. And then school administration are going to communicate with staff. Now obviously if you're if you're a person who's been part of the contact tracing, then you're going to specifically have been communicated with as part of contact tracing. You're going to have received a call, you're going to have answered questions, you're you're, you're going to have been told whether or not you know, you might you might need to be a person in quarantine, but the school administration and or Ms. Baptist and her team are, are going to let people know. And just like with 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 anything, we're not going to share confidential personal information, personnel information. And we're going to implore people to to do their best to not not do that through, you know, through discussion or the grapevine, because let's face it, if you're in a building where suddenly Mr. Prokop has rushed in and, and closed off a room and is cleaning it. It's not too hard to figure out who works in that room, but but we can't broadcast that. We can't share that openly, and so uh, you know that's how mm -hmm. communication works in, in that case. So that's that's the official protocol and how communication works in terms of employees uh, during the protocol. And, and and I'm you know we're trying to make the distinction that this is very specific to the to the exposure protocol and to the procedures we have in place with the health department. It doesn't mean that principals, because they certainly are talking to their faculty and staff all the time about what do we do in one of these situations? How are we supposed to react? What are the steps? That stuff happens in meetings and in, in, in uh, faculty meetings, staff meetings as well. But but this is the communication specific to um, to notifying employees during the exposure protocol, contact tracing, et cetera. And uh, for students or families, Carl, you want to step through these where they were? Hey, hey, were John, a, a, question, a, a question on this. And, and I know Mr. Singer's seen it with the rec sports. Um, all this happens, and, and he said it earlier, people are nosy, but then some people truly are scared. But I know we, we had a, a coach's wife. She demand, Nobody had contacted her. Well, they said, you don't, you've never even seen the kid. So obviously you weren't exposed. But if I'm worried that I wasn't contacted, what do I do? Do I call somebody in the building? What, what's the communication if, if I'm worried why nobody talked to me and, and I'm not just nosy? Well, for employees, Mr. Kyler, they could certainly call their administrator, um, human resources if they wanted to. They could call one of us uh, in the, at the central level. And, and we would try to explain this to the person. And, um, you know, Mr. Singer's talked about the need to know and confidentiality and protecting information. And that's certainly the biggest, most important part of it. But the, the other thing we hope to eventually help people be, be more comfortable with as this happens, because this is happening and it is going to happen, is if we follow this protocol, then it's very clear. Because if you are a person who's been potentially exposed, if you are a close contact, you are absolutely going to know that. And in the case yeah. of students and families, you're going to get a very specific communication as well, uh, a, you know, written communication that clarifies that. So you won't have to worry or wonder um, you know, am I at any risk here at all? The contact tracing part of this would have would have revealed that to you, and, and you would know. And in the case of students, and I'm sorry, Carl, I'm stepping on you a little bit, but in the case of students, there's there's a distinction between the communication you're going to get as a family if I'm a student who's been exposed 
versus if I'm a student who maybe was in the classroom or the space where the exposure happened, but there's really contact tracing has has uh, concluded that I'm not uh, I'm not someone who's at risk or who who needs to be quarantined. I wasn't a close contact, and so. I guess it's hard to condition folks in, in the midst of normal life or even, a, you know, especially a global pandemic to say, you know, we would never say you don't need to know, but, yep. but it's, it's, if, if we follow the protocol and we all agree to, you know, to, to adhere to the protocol, then it's very, very clear if you, if you've been exposed or if you're a person who's, yep. a, who's, um, who's uh, in quarantine, because you'll know very specifically from the process and from the communication. And is, is it okay if I just chime in here real quick? Sure. I, I did want to point out that, uh, you know, our, our, our processes are, are different than what some other school systems are in other places because there, there are, uh, I think some of the board members may have mentioned this earlier. There are school systems out there that say if we have a case in the classroom, we're going to close the entire classroom. And, and I don't think that's necessary. And, and, it's, it, and it's not required under any of the CDC guidance or any of the state guidance. And, and I think following the contact tracing, just like we would in any other case, is the right thing to do. That way we're not unnecessarily putting people in quarantine or isolation that, that don't need to be there. So I, I think that's, uh, you, you know, you're going to hear that there are different things out there in, in different places throughout the country and throughout the world. Um, we think we've got the, we've got the right, right piece in place for us here in Carroll County. And Mr. Singer, I think to echo that a bit, and just to provide a touch of clarification, uh, closing the classroom for the, I believe the perspective you're talking about is quarantining all the students uh, to, to what Mr. O'Neill was talking about earlier with some of the cleaning protocols. We, we may need to, to close a classroom from a physical perspective. Um, I don't know if John, you want to provide any clarification to that so that folks aren't confused by that, that difference. Right. right. That, that's my fault. So let, let me just clarify in that we, we don't, Think that it's necessary to, to quarantine an entire group of students just because they've been in the same classroom and we went through the same thing with mcdaniel college and talking about if we're going to try to keep kids six feet apart there's a reason we're doing that and it's so that we don't have to quarantine them and that's that's the whole purpose we're putting these mitigation factors in place thank you ed carl were, were there other items uh, specific to communicating with families you wanted to no, I think, I, I, honestly, John, I think the way you covered is, is really where we are. Um, we, we will, I think the primary difference between the school operations with students and, and employees is um, our school health, our school nurses will be working with families and making that preliminary contact because the students are going to be in school and we'll be developing a line list and communicating that to the health department because like John said, just as with employees, we have access to you know, contact information of guardians and families um, that will just expedite our work with the, with the health department as they initiate the formal contact tracing process. But we will be calling families and asking the, the students that are close contacts to be picked up. Uh, those students don't need to go into isolation if they're a close contact, but we've identified and worked with our school administrators to talk about having um, a pickup location where the students can wait for parent pickup um, as you know, again, if they're close contacts and, and are symptomatic students, we may need to isolate and, and follow other procedures there. And as John said, we are going to be communicating um, any students who are symptomatic uh, will certainly be getting uh, a, a direct phone call as well as a, a letter that's uh, actually from the health department. And our close contacts will also get letters from that are generated by the health department. And then because of we understand the, the concern that families have uh, similar to what we do if we have a situation in, in um, mainly in elementary, it happens in other levels, but primarily elementary, when we have lice in school, we send a notification to families that are in a classroom that, are, that have an impact. So, so we have a letter that we're going to be sending to families informing them that there was uh, a, a potential um, COVID um, symptomatic situation, but that since they didn't receive a phone call, um, that their child's not a close contact. So we're going to call close contacts and symptomatic students um, because they need, to, they need to be picked up, as well as we want to have a, a communication with the family to kind of let them know what's happening with their children. So I think what John said about people learning that 
in essence, no news is good news. Um, so we'll have some people that get no communication because it wasn't a student that was in their class. Perhaps there was something at the school. There will be people who get a letter that says something happened within your classroom. Um, we don't want people to become numb to our communication because we, we believe there's going to be quite a bit of information coming out um, as we experience the, the symptoms and how we respond to those. So uh, we are going to make direct phone contact again uh, to the extent that we're able to any symptomatic student as well as close contacts and then share that with the health department so they can follow the line list. Mr. Streaker, I had a question. I might be jumping a little ahead here. Has there any been any discussion regarding our transportation um, and how they're going to be doing the AABB days, uh, how they're going to be splitting up the students? I'm sure there has been. That's part of a plan. Uh, Mr. Hardesty would probably be best equipped to answer that if he's on the call or, or John. I, I don't think I, you want me talking about buses. <laughs> I, I think Mike is here. Uh, but Cindy might, all, well, if Mike's here, he can go. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, we, uh, we have a plan for one child per seat with siblings and students from the same household accepted. All children will be required to wear a face mask, as, as will the uh, driver of the bus. Um, we are in the process of, of looking at the A and B information along with the parent intent form that was uh, relative to their desire to use transportation. And we're plotting that information on our bus routes to get an idea where we might be in excess of the one child per seat. We don't believe there would be many of those situations. In fact, many of the, um, the preliminary look that we have would indicate that we're gonna be well below the 21 uh, that we've established as necessary to be able to provide transportation. Has there been discussion as far as like, are you, are you still going to be doing like regular bus routes? Like, are you going to have the same bus in the same neighborhood on A day and B day? Or is it going to be split in some way? Because I, I kind of have a, an idea on how it could be done. And it would also help with contact tracing as well in the event of something. The buses will run their normal routes um, on both A and B days and we will, we will stop where there are students there to pick up. Um, we are requiring the bus drivers with the assistance of school staff to do a seating chart for both the A runs and the B runs, so we would be able to do contact tracing if necessary. Okay, um, one idea I had had, and it seemed like it would made sense regarding contact tracing and isolating if there was an is incident. Um, an example would be like Manchester Valley um, High School. You would take that area and cut it in half basically. So you have one end of the district going on AA day and then you have the other end going on BB day. So in the event that there is some type of outbreak I don't we don't I hope we know we'll have that but in the event we did you know that that area is the one area that has to be monitored and I think that would even be better for the health department to monitor and even any extracurriculars as well well there's certainly going to be a challenge in terms of how the students are divided um, they're, they're they're being divided on an academic basis which is you would think that would be the right way to do that, that they're not going to be divided on a geographic basis. So we do expect um, some unevenness in terms of how that's going to play out between A routes and B routes for, for different neighborhoods. Um, the buses for regular ed will be, as I said, running the regular routes. So we will know exactly what school uh, the exposure may have occurred in. Um, so, and with the seating charts, we do believe that we would be able to quickly determine um, any students that could potentially be uh, part of contact tracing um, and with the guidance from the local health department. Okay. Can I, I just want to chime in a, se a second. And I don't know that the uh, geographic locations of the students, and I, I kind of got the impression, uh, Ms. Pataglia, that um, 
the um, that, that the geographic locations of the students was kind of what you were thinking about. I really think when we're doing contact tracing, we're finding that this more runs in in social circles and and uh, you know who they're who they're carpooling with or who they're playing rec soccer with or or, or things of that nature more so than than geographically where they live. Um, so I, I don't know that it's important that we split it. Uh, you know, by region or anything of that nature. I, I think a lot of it has to do with the, uh, when it comes down to what we're finding in contact tracing and who's been in close contact, it's got more to do with friend groups and, and family groups and, and whose social circles people are running in as opposed to um, where necessarily they're living in a geographic area. I was just thinking, you know, this way, you kind of isolate any type of contact tracing to, to one like you that you know where to concentrate um, versus if you're picking up a deep run road and then you're also picking up on Snydersburg now you've got an area here and an area here and then a possible because of contact tracing now you got someone else here and someone else there you potentially could run into something where now it, it's spreading to different areas versus one area that's the only thing I was thinking as a way to isolate it in the event that someone does potentially have it. That's the only thing I was thinking. I would just add in here that um, the principals at each of our schools have been working really hard over the past few weeks to divide our students into uh, cohorts A and B um, and to make sure that those classrooms are divided uh, so that we don't have too many students um, in person at the same time so that we can socially distance. And they've also taken academic needs into consideration when doing uh, working on those cohorts. So um, they are ready to go with them and um, we are um, ready to send out communication to families um, when the Board of Ed makes a decision about the hybrid model. Is that uh, alphabet based primarily and just trying to figure out where to where to make the the cut? Yeah. Yes, it, it started out um, alphabetically. That was our that was the base that we worked from. And then we had to take into consideration families and whether families wanted this, their students, their children to all be in the same cohort or in separate cohorts. Um, and then we um, also looked at uh, the academic day and academic needs, and that played a part in it as well. So um, it's really been um, a long process for our building administrators to, to go through to get to the point that they are. Um, and so, um, again, once, um, once those communications go out to families, um, then um, if families have any concerns about uh, the cohorts, uh, they'll be encouraged to uh, call the school and talk that through. Okay. Thank you, uh, John and Carl, Cindy, for providing input there. Um, if there aren't any other questions on the um, pieces we just reviewed, uh, we'll continue on. I know we have another agenda item sort of related. We started this the last time, and that deals with consideration of indoor use of facilities. John? I was muted. I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, I, I believe at the last meeting, the, the board had uh, expressed some interest in having a more detailed conversation about the topic of uh, community use, uh, community indoor use of our school facilities. And so we promised to bring you back uh, some information that we did verbally discuss last time. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through some bullets real quick and ask Mr. Prokop to, uh, to make himself available as well as I advance here. So you, you asked what was allowed in the plan. And so the first slide here just just is a, um, some information for you and the public as to what the plan uh, at the moment, the plan we 
you voted on and then we submitted to MSDE um, says about use of facilities and basically it doesn't allow indoor use of facilities. We've allowed use of the fields for many, many months now. I think it was back in June where we began allowing that. Um, we have two uh, and only two that I'm aware of exceptions to um, inside the building being used. One is um, a single room at the Career and Tech Center that um, Carroll Community College is using. You've talked about that in, in these meetings in the past. Uh, that that runs, a, that runs a, an adult learning program and it's one room and um, the community college, when they reached out, agreed to have their staff trained by Mr. Prokop's team to uh, be sure that the COVID-19 cleaning and disinfecting protocols were met every night, and we can contain that in one space. The only other exception, which was also part of one of your public meetings, is uh, the, the use of certain schools, one space in those schools for um, for the uh, before and after daycare providers who've historically existed there. But other than that, it, in general, um, it doesn't permit use. And so if you want to take up this discussion and consider um, changing that direction, it, 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 these would be two sections of the plan where we would need to modify and then resubmit the, the plan to um, to MSD, I suppose, for their for their review one more time. Um, why the plan turned out the way it did back when we were doing the development of, of the initial drafts, I think Mr. Singer, I didn't mean to steal from him because I did this in advance, Ed, but I think earlier you talked about mitigating risk and limiting risk, and, and that was the general premise behind uh, the decisions made on use of facilities. So uh, just a couple things to consider. Some of this is actually this all dovetails fairly nicely this evening. Um, exposure Exposures might shut down parts of, um, parts of the building um, for a school the next day to, for the operation of school, and so this doesn't have so much to do with uh, the Carl Streaker part of the, the protocol, but the uh, CDC, John O'Neill, Ray Prokop I mentioned earlier, where we have the kind of, you're supposed to seal the space for 24 hours if you can, and then clean it, sanitize it in the next 24 hours. And so, uh, you, you know, there's to some degree, there's some, some risk in the fact that having indoor uh, community user groups indoors uh, could, could have impact on us having school in, in those rooms or those spaces um, the next day. Um, it, it's also hard to always control the movement or confine it to, to just one place and by our protocols, we need to make sure that we're cleaning and sanitizing every place where someone's been. And so we would need to somehow be certain that we know that. Um, and then I, I put this bullet in just loosely based on conversations I've had over, over time with Mr. Singer or members of his team. Uh, I think to some extent, it, it complicates contact tracing, at, at least in the sense that Carl just described how we support them on, with contact tracing in our schools, where we have uh, the list that, that Carl referred to, which we can put together. Uh, we we won't, won't necessarily know everyone who was in, in the building for, for these kinds of uses, how they got there, who they rode with, how they got home. And so there'd be a, an element of contact tracing where, uh, and maybe Ed would say it doesn't complicate it for him, but from our ability to support him, we, we would have very little ability, I think, to help pull that off. Um, big concerns about resources and um, both human, res well, mainly human resources to conduct the required cleaning and, and sanitizing. It, it's not, you know, in the past, indoor, indoor user groups can sort of clean up after themselves, and people are very good about that in general. But here in the world of COVID, we're talking about very specific protocols with um, the approved solutions or cleaning products that, that Mr. Prokop and his folks have to use. It, it's, it's, it's obviously, it's not you know, splitting the atom, and I could probably even be trained to do it, but there are protocols and you should be through the training to, to do it. Um, and it's, it involves either a misting spray and then a period of time passing and, and, and cleaning it up properly. Or uh, more recently, uh, Ray and his folks have moved to, um, to the ability to use um, these, these machines that, that do the misting with the, uh, with the sanitizing solution. And in that case, I'm not sure that we would really want to turn over those machines to to other people to use. I think it would be best for for our sake that that our folks do that. And so, um, you know, we don't really have people in the buildings overnight. We'd have to look at how we would staff that. I also have a concern, and, and you could say this about pretty much every part of the system right now as we look at at a move, moving to hybrid. Um, so we're not 
unique to this in building operations. But these folks have been working really hard for a long time. I consider them heroes, and I mean that. I'm proud of the work they've done from the very beginning. But I'm not sure how we would support this if it grew larger scale, like before the pandemic, unless we basically had them working seven days a week. Um, and essentially, not literally a third shift like in historic times, but they have to be in there later at night to run the misting machine and that sort of thing. I just, and I don't know if, if, if um, in the back of my mind, at least I have the, the note there about liability. I didn't necessarily consult Ed O'Mealy specifically on that. He might want to, he might want to comment if he disagrees, but my sense also is we, we have to be careful that we, you know, I'd, I'd want to be very judicious about who else we let do the cleaning and sanitizing protocol for us because we're going to own that liability for the fact that it, it did in fact happen and it didn't in fact happen um, properly. And then the final bullet there really has little to do with sort of the world that, that, that Ray and I work in every day, but more for the, the folks in the school. It's the, um, at the high schools, it's generally the athletic directors. At the middle and elementary schools, it's generally one of the administrators, but whoever the coordinator for use of facilities is, it's, um, you know, that's a job they do anyway, but it's going to be a little bit different, a little more detailed in, um, in a COVID world, because for instance, one of the things that's going to be added to their workload is figuring out that, that contact tracing support element for, um, for Mr. Singer and, and his team. So those were our thoughts as we put the plan together. Um, I think at the time we were pretty sure that our plan was fairly consistent with what we were seeing other systems across the state have. Um, and then, at the last meeting, we had mentioned that Mr. Prokop was in the midst of trying to do a survey of his peers or or the folks in the other 24 or 23 districts in Maryland who, who coordinate indoor use of facilities or use facilities. He um, he's bulleted his uh, results here. Um, there's I, I, it, Ray, if you're there, speak up because that third sure. bullet I think you need to explain. Sure. Uh, yes, the, re, the we. we uh, we pulled the, the other jurisdictions uh, uh, with the help of MABE uh, and got the 16 responses. And uh, uh, as you can see with the, the asterisk that we, we've, uh, the other jurisdictions are uh, doing, uh, as, as John had mentioned, that the, there's child care, there is some community college use, uh, but we also doing meal distributions where we're setting up for SATs. Uh, the, the polling, they'll be used as polling centers uh, for the upcoming election, which is its own um, uh, planning, uh, quite a bit of planning. Uh, so, so there are uses, um, but when we talk about more general use of facilities by uh, typical user groups, uh, the 16 that responded, really, it's really 16 out of 16, because when I clarified with the uh, one jurisdiction uh, about the uh, allowing the additional use with a, with a charge, as it turns out, that county has not allowed uh, rec, rec sports, for instance, to um, uh, to uh, to start up again, so they're not really experiencing that request. So really, it's 16 out of 16 are just not using uh, or not allowing general use of facilities, and it's uh, essentially for the same reasons um, that that we're um, you know that, that John cited in the in the previous slides. And uh, I think everybody knows I have strong feelings about this, but. I, I do feel strongly we need to get open hybrid. I've got some strong feelings about that too. Uh, well, I'll, I'll let that go till later. I just, uh, I've, we have a motion to what to open and, and it passed. Um, but everybody seems to still question whether or not we want to open. Um, but for this, I just think maybe by Thanksgiving, maybe by some time we need to look at this hard and reevaluate it. And, uh, um, one of the jurisdictions is requiring that the rec programs clean and they're making it so hard that they're choosing not to use a school and maybe that's a good step but I know a lot of these programs have cleaned I mean with ringworm SARS and the other infections uh, we actually bought two of the high schools mops and disinfected and showed them how to clean mats and they clean them after practice and we clean them after practice. So I, I think this has to happen. I don't want to jeopardize opening hybrid and I don't want to jeopardize opening full, but I just think sooner or later, this is another step we need to take. And, and, but in all honesty, 
as far as where it ranks and the order of things, it's, it's behind opening hybrid, it's behind opening full. So I think the plan, I fully understand why the plan was written like this and should have been, but I just think we need to start considering at some point in time. And the other thing that's happening, the other thing that's happening, and I assume it's not illegal, uh, a lot of your high school kids are now in rec programs now, and uh, they will be at uh, Copper Mine or there will be at clubs in Baltimore because they want to practice and they want to improve their skills. And, and we're going to need places for people to do that. If North Carroll ever sells, uh, we're about dead in this county, and uh, um, I think Parks and Rec's going to have to look hard at are they going to start paying for facilities? What are they going to do to keep these programs viable? Because we need to keep these kids active. And, and it's another test for us. And Mr. Singer, I don't know how it's been countywide, but I know there's been some cases. I think it's been well handled. And uh, um, it, it's, it seems to be going OK that these kids are playing the rec sports. But, but again, like I say, I, the priorities behind getting our kids in school. And, and it has to be. Baby steps. And I, I agree, Kenny. You know, I was with you. I have seen you clean wrestling mats before. <laughs> but You yelled uh, at me when they weren't clean. Uh, exactly, because I, I got tired of hearing ringworm. Uh, but it, it does work. And we definitely need to do this for our, our students to get back uh, to that eventually. And I, I do know that there is that caveat that we've got to get the schools open first. But that is a big uh, uh, mental, social, and emotional thing that our athletes need. And I want to say something before we start to play uh, for, I, want, I have a statement to say before we do the updates on return to play. But uh, yes, uh, and winter's coming. And I know that uh, Rick Council is going to need basketball areas. and. Uh, uh, I don't they have have they requested it or I don't know I don't know that we received any, any request facility requests at well, this point right yeah no, we, we wouldn't <clears throat> we, we work with the rec councils uh, work with, with Mr. Daggett's closely and, and they understand our uh, the position of the uh, you know the plan that, that we have in place so there has been no request because yeah. they know not that there yeah. no need request at this point uh, yeah, the rec councils all knew they could request outdoor and they cannot request right. indoor. Well, it, you know, right. we need to go back and look at that when, when, when the time is correct, because I, I feel for these children that need to be doing athletics or, or doing activities. It's, it, it's a need. It is a need. Is that, is that a good uh, segue into the return to play updates? Yep. Um, Marcia, did yeah. you say you wanted to read something? Yeah, I, I really do. Look, you all know that I coached in this county for many years, and I was very fortunate, and I had some really good teams both at North Carroll and South Carroll. But my heart really goes out to these kids, to these athletes. Uh, I just got to say a few words, and some of my thinking that I've done. Um, I did vote yes to open up the daycares, and I thought that was going to be a segue to then open up for the use of our facilities. Um, I thought it'd be a litmus test, and that has gone well. But um, then I felt that the next step would be to allow sports teams to return to practice. This is my own opinion right now. MPSSAA has tied our hands, and Montgomery County PG and Anne Arundel County should not be running what we do in Carroll County. I go by Copper Mine all the time. There we are, right on Route 482. There are our varsity hockey players playing hockey every night there. They've got a ball, they've got a stick in their hand, and we can't even give them anything they can only con condition. Um, that doesn't look right. Something's wrong with that picture. We have rec council all over the county, and we need to wake up and try to figure this out. Uh, these athletes need to be on our fields, they need to be in the locker rooms, and I know they can't c travel all over, but we could have some kind of competitions in, in the county. Um, Carroll County Times this week, there was a Carroll, Carroll Community College runner in cross country. And I'd even ask uh, the athletic uh, supervisor, you know, wh why can't we even do that? And MPSA has put the squash to that thing. That. 
Uh, Carroll Community is also having boys and girls soccer practice with soccer balls. They are practicing. They are taking their uh, temperatures every day. They are following the guidelines. So we've got oh. colleges up and running. We've got rec pro programs running and not with a lot of difficulties. And I just think we need to get up and running too better than what we're doing besides conditioning. Um, I know for a fact that I picked up my granddaughter every day for a week or two at North Carroll High School and they had basketball camps. It was run very well, they did the protocols and they had no instance of any, any problems. I just think we need to wake up and see how we can help these kids uh, in Carroll County. They need to follow the guidelines, we need to take their temperatures and we need to move, move forward besides just conditioning. I know for a fact um, in August, I got new, I got, I needed some lights done. And here this, this 17 year old, six foot four kids in my barn fixing lights. And I said, do you play sports? He goes, yes, ma'am, but I can't. Because here he is a college senior quarterback and his father is paying for someone to take videos and help to promote him to go to college. And that, it's just terrible. So I think we need to open this up somehow. I don't know how, I'm not in charge, but I feel for these kids and we really need to do more than what we're doing right now. But the caveat is we can't mess up school opening on that. So um, I just hope you all consider that. I don't know what the answer is, but I know for their mental well-being and social well-being and emotional well-being, they need sports. And I, I know it works. I've lived around ath athletes all my life. So, okay, thank you. I had to so, say what I had to say. Cindy, do you want to start with the update? And yes, uh, so Ms. Herbert, I would say that, yes, I, I agree. Many people um, in the system are concerned about uh, the state of our athletics and, um, you know, want desperately to get things started. Um, I will turn it over to Mr. Duffy at this time uh, so he can give us an update on um, where we are as a system with uh, athletics. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate this. I just hope we can do something for our kids. Thank you, Ms. McCabe. Uh, good evening, board members. Um, just to give you a recap, uh, we began our non-sport specific conditioning uh, the week of September 14th last week for our students. We are in consultation with the health department to move to our next phases, which include both sports skill, excuse me, sports skills and competitive activities. We hope to then, we hope to then move into similar periods for spring sports beginning in late October, followed by winter sports beginning in December. The MPSSAA two semester plan was approved uh, just uh, about just under two weeks ago on September 11th. Uh, the plan allows for these types of activities that we're currently offering in the first semester, including the sports condition, uh, the conditioning, sports skills, and competitive activities. With the second semester, we'll include abbreviated seasons of winter, then fall, and finally spring athletics, all starting as planned on fe February 1st, uh, 2021. There has been talk throughout the MPSSAA of moving the start date of interscholastic athletics to a date that is earlier than February 1st. Um, I do, I, we do need your input. If that were approved, would you as a board be comfortable with our schools participating when that is allowed? And that's kind of where we are right now. Are any of the other counties doing anything differently? Orig and, and they all, you know, as well as I, like Garrett County said two months ago, they were going to have fall sports and they don't care if they're state champs or not. Um, but did any of them do anything renegade or are they all pretty much trying to toe the line? Everyone is structuring their programs different to for their specific needs. Uh, several, most of the surrounding counties are in virtual only engagement with their athletes. I can say Frederick County is currently doing sports skills. They're a few weeks ahead of us. Um, they're in their fall sports skills. We're hopeful to get to ours in the next week. Um, I believe the only, uh, there is one county on the Eastern shore, and I don't want to swear which one it is, so I, I'll get it wrong, so I'd rather not mm -hmm. say, uh, who is engaging in some level of scrimmages. Um, no one is allowed to select teams at this time, and I believe 
St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland is also doing something similar to that. There are some counties. We are um, not necessarily all the way at the front, but we're right near the front of the line right now with, with our plan and our activities as they are set. And I don't know what the rest of the board says, but if you can get the state to start late next week, we're for it. <laughs> You know, well, I, in all seriousness, yeah. the sooner you can make it happen, we're, we're, nobody here has got any objections, do they? No, I must say that I'm certainly totally in agreement with starting as soon as we can. Um, I don't know, you would have thought it was Christmas a thousand times magnified when football came back on and, of course, with the <laughs> basketball and the baseball. I mean, yeah. you know, and again, to, to know that we've got, um, especially our seniors, who've excelled in their sports and, you know, are just getting limited opportunities at this point. I really do feel for them. So, you know, I think the sooner we can move forward with that, um, you know, the better it's going to be for them and, and really for us as well. And we're blessed you have a strong voice at the state level. And I don't think anybody here wants us to be renegade and give up the opportunity to have state champions and do things per the state. But, but I think we're, we want to do it. And I think, and, and what I'm asking, and um, uh, I'm, is whether if the dates are adjusted to earlier, because we're not going to be able to move ahead of the rest of the state. We we will need to move in line with what is permitted. But if the dates were adjusted to be earlier, and as I said, there has been talk through the NPSSAA about that being a possibility, um, because I understand there there is a desire to have students back and participating. There is an interest, obviously. It's um, it's a major in, uh, important component for many students' lives. We get that completely. But I, I guess we need to just, we wanted to know if that is something that you are, um, if you are in support of. I think that was a resounding yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was questioning. I uh, any if you can start it tomorrow, that's fine with me. But in all honesty, I don't know. I don't understand how you can do three sports seasons from February to the end of May. So if you can get that date moved up at all, that would be greatly appreciated. Well, you 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 do. They laid it out. It's yeah. con, it's condensed. Right. Yes. Um, and and that it is I, significantly condensed. Right. And there are um, definite issues we have we have and concerns with it right. involving overlap for students, uh, overlap yeah, okay. for coaches, and the other issue that we need to obviously take into account, overlap for facilities. It's going to be difficult to run the end of a basketball season at the same time as volleyball oh, tryouts. Wow. Right, um, absolutely. I, I, mm -hmm. I think we're gonna have a hard time with you know basketball kids getting clotheslined by a volleyball net. <laughs> Uh, I've seen that happen. Okay. <laughs> so what is the earliest date that you think that they might consider? And is there anything that we can do or that, you know, we can push on our um, state delegates or, or anything like that in order to get it moved as early as possible? We really don't know what the earliest date would be. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, information will, will come out shortly from MPSSAA, and as soon as it does, um, you know, hopefully uh, late this week, next week, we will be able to uh, inform you right away. And there'll be some considerations, you know, whether it's, you know, later this fall or it stays in January, February timeline, depending on where we are in our in our progress with bringing, because, and I do believe our focus and we've heard it here tonight should be on returning students for instruction but we recognize the importance of extracurriculars and and all that comes with that um, we got to think about things like getting how do students get to if, if I'm not in school that day um, how do I get to practice um, and we, we want to make sure that that's not a reason that kids won't participate because they don't have anybody to get them there so there, there's some other things I think we have to think about along with this, depending on whenever it is um, that, um, yeah, you know, I, I recognize um, that importance. I just want to make sure there's just other logistics associated with it that we'd have to sort of work through. I, I think um, we'll be blessed. And, and, and Mrs. Herbert already mentioned some of the bigger counties, but a, a lot of those counties 
aren't as fortunate as us with the health department and our COVID numbers and Absolutely. whatever. And I think, I think it's going to take a lot of push to get it moved. I don't think it's going to come too early for us because I don't think the rest of the state's going to let it happen. Some of the bigger counties, like you say, Eastern Shore and Garrett County, they, they might have had a football game tonight for all we know, but, but not Anne Arundel and PG. Uh, may I please add one more thing? Um, I, I do want to make clear, not only to you, but to anyone who's watching, that the amended uh, directive and order from the Maryland Department of Health back from September 1st uh, speaks specifically to both high school and college sports that they may not open to spectators or to the general public. So that is something that would be a part of that if we were able to begin anything. And barring a change from that, uh, from that directive, uh, we would be playing to empty stadia, and empty gymnasiums. And when are we going to be able to really televise? I know we were looking at that one. We have everything set up. Um, everything has been installed for uh, the NFHS network. Yes. We have not done test runs. Uh, so we need to ensure that everything is is up and working. But I can say, for, I can say with 100% certainty, there is a camera in every stadium and there is a camera in every gym. Oh, good. Great. All right, let's get it tried out. <laughs> Well, you go out there to Man Valley. Okay. <laughs> Kendall stay on one end, you okay. stay on the other. We'll yeah, I'm glad you made that point because I think, that's, that's a good like point. you say, the parents, everybody needs to hear that. And yeah, right. we're all selfish. None of us want to sacrifice anything. But I think if we can get the kids doing it and we got to watch it on TV, so be it. Yeah. You know, it's, They'll it's be happy. Uh, it has to happen. Yep. Okay, well, we'll wait and see if there's any, any changes. To, to any of the uh, you know direction from MPSSA at this point, and maybe we can fill our stadiums with cutouts. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I, my, 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 Advertising. I, I, my motion, my motion would be, uh, <laughs> Dr. Locker, we need to get a cut out of you and put it in every gym because it seems like every agenda thing we're like throwing you one more ball to juggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> throwing you one more thing. Oh. <laughs> uh. Okay, Mr. Duffy, thank you very much, Ms. McCabe. Thank you. So I know at this point we wanted to uh, move on if, if board members are there, and, and yep. um, we do want to provide some updates regarding employee leave. Now, we heard earlier in the meeting we do want to try to continue with the target date um, that was established for the hybrid. Um, but there, are, and as we talked about all the, the health and safety implications. You know, we want to do it as safely as possible, but we also want to make sure that, um, you know, that we try our, our best to continue our instructional programs um, with, with a certain level of efficacy as well. And I think here, I want to talk about a couple things. One is we've had conversation about employee leave and the potential impacts that could have. I also want to talk, and there's been some conversation about um, just the, the hybrid model of instruction in general and so i want to make sure we get a couple minutes to speak to that as well but let's start with um em employee leave and i've asked miss baptist to provide some updated numbers perhaps you can you can john you can maybe kick off or or miss baptist that um we we are obligated um employees have rights in in, in our system and, and we are obligated to provide those uh, rights to them as it relates to um, different kinds of, of leave that are uh, availed at any time, really, um, and um, want to provide some update in terms of the impact that potentially has um, on us as a system. So, John, and then Chantress. Okay, thank you. And these are these are some topics, as you mentioned, we've we've spent some time on. You've spent um, time in previous meetings, I think, with Mr. O'Malley going going over these categories. So. In general, it falls into leave requests or requests for what we would call reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so there's different types of leave, and Enchantress might break out some, some data relative to the different types of leave. But people can write in and say, you know, I believe that I have a qualifying condition uh, under the, the ADA, the Americans with Disability Act, and I'm I'm requesting with, with my medical documentation a reasonable accommodation to to be a virtual only teacher um, in, in the instance of a teacher. I, I wouldn't be able to come into my classroom, but I could still teach virtually um, from home. And so 
that's not, you don't just write in and say that. There's a process involved with that. You submit a request, Chantress and her team review that. They require medical documentation and paperwork and they make those decisions. They call, they consult Mr. O'Mealy and his team when they need to. Um, separate from that, I, I may not have a, a condition under the ADA, but I may say I have some other circumstance in life that I believe qualifies me for a type of leave. and. And I don't want to go through them at length, but um, we've talked before about the Family First Coronavirus Response Act leave. Um, that's a, a leave program that the federal government instituted at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's in place until at least um, July. It would, exp or I'm sorry, December. It would expire at the end of December if if it's not reauthorized in some way. There's also the Family Medical Leave Act. There's there's long-term leaves of absence under the negotiated um, agreements. Some of these leave categories. Um, may be paid, some may be paid to the extent that the employee has a balance of accrued leave themselves, and then some some forms of leave are unpaid. So hopefully with that reminder or that summary, Chantress can, can go through uh, some of the data that she's received. And I want to commend her and her team because that after the earlier meetings, they made a push to try to get information out. Also the unions, especially CCA, uh, to say, hey, we, we need as much lead time as possible to plan because this isn't going to be you know, necessarily seamless to, uh, to to perform staffing in this scenario. So to the extent that as an employee could, could write in sooner than later, we would be grateful. And people have done that. So unless you have questions, I'll just ask Chantress to start talking about the numbers. Good evening, board members. So as of today, we have 238 educators that have filed a notification or request for leave related to returning in the hybrid format. Again, as John stated, when an employee applies for Family First Corona Response, Americans with Disabilities, and or Family Medical Leave, the request is subject to review and HR approval. Employees are required to supply medical documentation and or daycare provider information to support the request. Before this evening's meeting, we've received supporting documentation and approved 66 Family First Corona Response Act requests, which are related to child care, 23 American with Disabilities Act, which is medically documented, and we have had 149 ADA requests since last Thursday, September the 17th, of which 119 were medical related, 26 had relations to, uh, medical relations to a family member and two other individuals were requesting to retire due to their COVID related conditions and one we're still trying attempting to confirm. The aggregate data demonstrates that at each level elementary middle and high will be impacted basically at the same level. Um, requests are across all subject and support areas. 90% of our schools were impacted by at least one educator requesting a leave associated with FFCRA or ADA. Um, no requests were received for four of our schools, um, including Gateway, Career and Tech, Eldersburg, and Hampstead. Whereas uh, we, we do have concerns that we do have a middle school and a high school with at least 14 at individuals at one school and 15 at the other educators that have expressed concerns with reporting back to the environment. Um, if we had started, if we, if we start today, we'll have again approximately, even once we confirm the request, we will have the need for at least 200 um, substitutes, long-term substitutes during this time. Um, staff will have the ability to take their leave when the need arrives. However, we are stressing for staff at any time to please let us know their intentions by September the 30th. This gives us the opportunity as a staff, um, as a human resources office to try to staff and to gain substitutes as soon as possible. Um, it has, it will present the staffing challenges, but we will rise to the challenge. Any questions in regards to the data? It is what it is. Yes. Well, yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll just hit it. You know, the elephant in the room is that, you know, that has the potential 
uh, to uh, impact the continuity of, of instruction. And so, you know, I, I think we've had this conversation before. Um, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna find um, 200 teachers ready out there on the streets that just haven't found a job somewhere. Um, substitutes are always hard to come by. Now we've put a lot of measures in place to try to train up additional staff, expanding the in-house substitute, um, permanent substitute um, uh, position. Um, but I, I wanna be clear with everybody that that will present some challenges um, for us and, and we're going to need a lot of patience and flexibility from folks as we try to navigate through there's There is not an easy answer to that. It's going to be a giant puzzle and I, and I know our, our principals in, in buildings and our directors and folks um, are, are constantly working on that puzzle, um, but there's there's no one easy answer to that um, and so I just want to make sure that that we're, we're say, stating the obvious, which is that will present challenges for us. So, Ms. Baptist, can you repeat the, you said there was one middle school that had 14 and one high school that had 15? Yes, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that, that are approved and through the process or requested? They have started, so they have started, started the initial the phases of the request process. Yeah by documenting or providing medical information and diagnosis. It, is this spread out across staff? Is this primarily teachers or is this, um, you know, so two, counselors, nurses, whatever? Yeah, well, this 238 would include school counselors. We have nine school counselors that have requested you know, leave. Okay. John, you're about to say something. That's what Dr. Locke was saying earlier, and this is sort of, I'm, I'm stealing from Mr. Duffy a minute ago, just to sort of put the put the bad news knowledge out there in front of everyone so they can they can understand what, you know, some of the things that are gonna happen. If, if you think about some of these staffing situations that you can extrapolate from the from the kind of numbers that Chantress is talking about. And also, if you go back to Mr. Mr. Streaker's presentation of the exposure protocol and, um, how people get quarantined based on that or or they're out for a few days for um, a test or test results and I'm, I'm talking about employees now not not certainly students there, there are going to be times where we probably will not be able to make a classroom happen in person um, for you know you could pick any of those reasons and hopefully it's not very much hopefully it's it's not often um, but it seems that whether it's staffing concerns based on this or an exposure where somebody has to be quarantined, um, there may be times where Ms. McCabe's principals will be saying, you know, this, this particular class isn't going to be able to be in person this week for this cohort. And, and so those students would become virtual for that time period. And I hope I didn't jump ahead, Dr. Lockhart. I know you probably also want to talk about what the hybrid instructional model is looking like here. Um, but, that's just something that you know we're all going to have to figure out and do our best on and, and deal with. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's going to be something that we're all going to have to sort through with our community as well, school by school, classroom by classroom, as those situations occur. Right, and so we're in the the situation where if a a teacher um, has is going to be teaching virtually, right? So I, th I think we. Ms. Baptist, how, how many um, did you say were approved for ADA accommodations? So far already approved are 23. 23. Okay, so I mean, it, and at least those 23 where um, the teacher would be teaching virtually, but if we have the hybrid classroom, so the students will be in the building, but the teachers will not, right? And so that's the situation where you're saying an instructional assistant would be in front of the class to help facilitate that so that the teacher would be basically piped into the hybrid classroom that's that's one potential solution however <clears throat> i don't want to send kids to school two days a week to have all of their classes be virtual mm -hmm. i can understand mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. if guess. we have a class and you got to think too about people's certification and content 
it would we'd be better off having the AP chemistry or what whatever the specialized courses that that person has an accommodation that one of the mods during the day perhaps in the classroom it's piped in virtually and we'd have supervision and that's something we'll have to work on too but I don't want that for the bulk of a student's day that kind of defeats the purpose of coming to school Hybrid, yes, absolutely. now that is part of the puzzle that we have to figure out however and I can't sit here and guarantee that there might be some random combination somewhere where you know that happens more to somebody than not depending on their schedule and who their teachers are I would hope not I'm just trying to lay out all the potential challenges um, that are associated with that so we can manage expectations dr Walker, we and we haven't talked uh, much about the students and rumor has it we maybe didn't lose as many as we were worried about which will be a great thing for future money but do do we know how many students don't want to do hybrid and want to stay virtual is that is that a big number or it and and i know that just complicates us more no but, that's that's a great question part of the thing when we polled um our our parents back in mid-august and cindy you presented that i believe it was approximately eight thousand students at the time uh, that were indicated to continue all virtually correct cindy yes i don't have the numbers in front of me right this minute, but what I remember is yes, it was about 8,000. So that would them. mean about 17,000 want to come in for the hybrid. Yes. Now, when when will we ask them again? And, and I'm glad we didn't do any more surveys. Um, <laughs> it, but but now, but now no, I'm serious. I mean, we, we ignored the results. Um, but but we need now the facts and and I knew I knew I had a bunch of friends. Well, my kid's not going to school because he won't wear a mask. And I think uh, what they what they're going through right now has made some of them a little more flexible with life. So I'm I don't think it'll be the eight thousand, but you know it may well be close. So how how do we find that out? Because like you say, you're doing what what I saw again in Pennsylvania, they did the AAs BBs and they. They did it strictly alphabetical without any more thought, and one teacher had 20 kids Monday, Tuesday, and four kids Thursday, Friday. And again, this the ones that want to be virtual complicate that even more, which I know you guys, you've been fighting this for months, so you know that, but, but what's, what's our answer? So, Mr. Kyler, our, our principals have been working um, really hard in uh, putting students in cohorts A and B and getting ready for those who want 100% virtual. So what's going to happen is, is we are ready to, um, once the board uh, votes on a date that we go back hybrid, we're ready to send out an email to all of our families, letting them know the information we have about their wishes for each of their students that they have in our school system. Uh, so, you know, the, the email, the letter will say, this is, this is what you wrote on the, um, on the last survey, on the parent intention form, and this is what we've been preparing for. So it will say, uh, your student, uh, John Smith, is slated to be in cohort A. Uh, or cohort B, or uh, you've selected 100% virtual. And then it will say underneath, um, if you have any questions or concerns regarding this placement, please call the school at, and then the school's phone number. So in that way, um, we're not asking them to fill out another survey. We're just telling them what we have on record, what we've been planning for, and if there's a change, they'll need to let us know. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, good plan. So, I mean, just a thought to and trying to so a staffing plan is is in the process of being developed to to handle ADA, FMLA, FFCRA. Um, so, assuming that it, we know that we're going to have trouble getting enough teachers to fill those spots and we may or may not have Has enough audio stop 
Oh, can can you not hear me, Chantress? Can you hear me? I can hear now. I can hear everyone now, but there was a lull. Oh, okay. Sorry. I guess I wasn't close enough to my mic. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so I was saying, you know, a staffing plan is under development now to handle the, the ADA, FMLA, and FFCRA um, leave requests, um, assuming that and we know that we're going to have trouble getting enough teachers. We certainly won't be able to get enough teachers. Um, we may even have some problems with getting enough people um, to just have someone present, even if it's not a teacher, like in the classroom, correct? Um, so is there a contingency plan or something that we would talk about? Like, does it make, does it alleviate the situation a little bit if when we go hybrid that it's just elementary school to start or does that, does that do anything or does that not do anything? Um, I, so I'm back and forth on that because yes, the younger ages, they need those social skills and they need that interaction and they, they need that structure but we also have our high school students that we're getting emails from parents that are talking about the mental health of their child and how difficult their high schooler is having right now. You know, I mean, we're hearing that we have high school students who are typical straight A students currently getting C's and they're freaking out. They're, they're worried that their future is in a mess right now. So I'm, I am back and forth on the ages. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Vigny, um, just to give you the data per the level, um, because we have more elementary schools than the other two levels. Mm -hmm. We have 107 elementary requests, mm -hmm. 58 middle, and 73 related to high school. And yeah. what are our other options? Is there, do we have any other options in terms of at least getting people, at least getting coverage of a classroom? It may not be a, a teacher that's certified in the right area. <clears throat> right, I mean, our, our options are kind of limited because the state does require us to have a certified teacher um, per the level or content uh, specific in the secondary. Um, you know, it's about trying to find coverage and that's not a great long-term instructional strategy. It's just not, um, you know, we, we wrestle in non-pandemic times with substitutes in terms of getting enough of them to fill the vacancies that we currently have. Um, to your point, Ms. Battaglia, um, I don't know how it helps a student's mental health if now they get to go to school and they don't have a teacher um, or their teacher or, you know, a, a certified uh, teacher. So there's not, I don't, I don't have an easy answer um, for that. Um, we can, we can certainly beat the bushes for hourly support to help with coverages. We can try to pipe folks in where they're on a, a, a accommodation virtually, that's a solution. But again, I don't want that to be an entire student's day. Um, I look to Mr. O'Neill or Ms. Baptist for any additional, or even Mr. O'Mealy for any additional ideas. Um, we've, we've, we have thought and thought and thought and thought and have been waiting and looking to see what are these numbers gonna pan out and what are they gonna look like? And, we're not, we're not the only system that, <laughs> it's not a unique problem. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's gonna be a challenge uh, across the board. Um, and what and, about and this? I would just like oh. to throw out to the board, there is no deadline, there is no official deadline for an employee to file for any of these protected benefits under federal law. And so at any given time, an employee can, needs may change, yeah. and we may see us even greater uptick or we may see a little bit of a down, uh, downward slope. Um, however, we don't know those numbers could have fluctuate. Whereas we were utilizing and in our current um, virtual environment, when we had a teacher absence due to normal absenteeism, 
uh, we had the ability and the flexibility to use our instructional assistants and have them serve as teachers in charge for those absences. However, when we go to the virtual environment, those individuals will go back to their physical roles of performing as an instructional assistant. So they will no longer be available to help fill our gaps if there's any um, or a substantial amount of teacher absenteeism. Okay, and for the folks who are um, approved for taking or leave, that would be effective on... Or, or we'd have to then backfill the instructional assistant. So if we can't find the instructional assistants to fill the physical um, classroom, uh, instructional assistants become very, very critical when we move to hybrid. Um, hybrid really, uh, it, it can't really go at all without the instructional assistants in place as well because they're going to be in addition to all the ways in which they support education of students they're also critical to the you know the daily operations of the schools for lunch times and recess times and movements throughout the school um so you know president savigny the i guess and maybe dr lockhart already said this there's probably not a solution there's a a lot of different ways in which we'll try to tackle this sometimes it might be getting a teacher, another cert certified person, if we're fortunate. Sometimes it might be relying on that instructional assistant to fill the, the physical classroom and trying to backfill the instructional assistant because that person still has to exist in some way and do those roles. Um, you know, Dr. Lockhart, I think, said sometimes it maybe we can pull in some hourly mm. uh, per contracted persons to, to help fill in and, and somehow, you know, put, put the puzzle, to use his analogy, together to make you know, to make that room in that school go. And it, and it may be different room by room, even within a school. And John, if I can add to that, um, the instructional implications, um, Nick and I have been visiting all the sites um, of our small groups, and I've never seen a group of professionals work as hard as they are out there in the buildings right now. And I can tell you without any hesitation that our instructional assistants and student support assistants are doing uh, amazing work with our students and we're going to need those assistance i understand what john's saying in regards to the operations of the building but they also have their instructional responsibilities that they need to fulfill um, on a daily basis working with students has anyone that has applied for leave um are these currently working now or no I think, would the effective date be October 5th? Yes. So the, the, the all of the individuals that have currently applied are working in the virtual format, and their effective dates will begin October 5th when they have to physically report. And, and uh, still the students, but it, it sounds like even if, even if 6,000 want to stay virtual, that's, that's a quarter of our students. But they're probably so spread out that that just complicates things. That it might help when everything shakes out, but for now, it's it's hard to plan. Yep, it's very fluid. That's the same dilemma with our staff, Mr. Kyler. Mm -hmm. I think there's some subjects too that are easier to teach online versus better to teach in a classroom. And definitely math, sciences, like those are. You need the visualization for those. You know, you need that writing, and you need to be able to how to <clears throat> do enzymes and and those type of things. You need in an actual classroom, and I. That's what I hear. That's what I'm seeing that our students or high school students particularly are struggling in. So yeah, Miss Patag, I'm sorry, Miss Patagla, you mentioned we were talking about that earlier about science labs and Mr. Kyler was asking, are there any particular content areas that we could potentially consider looking at virtual? And and I guess you have to talk to the teacher, right? Everyone's talking about how difficult their content is to teach virtually as opposed to traditional ways. Um, but I, I do think that you do have a point there that there are uh, portions of of coursework that, that are best hands-on. And I know that we've worked hard to get our CTE students in because of that reason. Mm -hmm. So back to your original question, Ms. Savigny, um, if you looked at uh, like a certain grade span um, to start, that, that will help the other grade spans can, you know, with continuity because then we're not facing all these potential staff shortages. 
Um, but I think it's just delaying sort of an inevitable uh, situation. <clears throat> I think you're right. And, and, and it looks like the staff's pretty spread out even. And it's not like uh, one was a giant gap. Um, yeah. Right, I mean, we've got about roughly equivalent students in elementary school versus middle plus high. And so it's a, a relatively even split there between the number of teachers at ele elementary plus the, the middle and high together. Is there is there anything that we can do about the child care situation and any? Well, you know, the um, so the Family First Coronavirus Relief Act leave that you said that was 66 Chantress. Yeah, those are correct, yeah. and those are all related to child care, correct? That is correct. Right. Um, so we certainly could ex explore or consider something for our employees um, to support, um, you know, them with that. Um, I'd be certainly willing to entertain that conversation and, and see if there's anything we can do to support that. But you'd have to be considering the ages of the child care that's needed, right? When right. we look at that. That's right. And Ed O'Mealy, legally we can do that? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act family uh, leave portion with respect to uh, uh, the absence of uh, child care availability uh, is triggered by either a school closure or the absence of a uh, caregiver. And if the children are uh, home because they're not in school, but we open the school, then that would eliminate uh, the need for the families to take the FFCRA leave because we would be opening the school for those families. So rather than having the children of the teachers going to school two days a week, they would now go to the school building five days a week. They would still per, uh, participate in the hybrid instruction in class on the two days a week, but then on the other days, we would have them coming in in some kind of a uh, care support uh, learning pod or some other arrangement where they would have uh, the care provided in the school. Have uh, and other counties and have been done this? The, um, that we were looking at for each week, that's to be the day of deep cleaning, right? <clears throat> so are we planning to have folks in the building on right. Wednesdays? So, so by and large, we're not requiring people to be there Wednesdays because we don't want in, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell somebody they, they can't come in, but we, we don't want, we're not going to, that's why we're not having students there. We're not having the majority of staff there. Um, I, I do want to say that, you know, that's where there a lot of their technology and stations are set up. Um, if they're in, in, obviously you're in the hybrid, you're there doing that. So we're working on a plan to make sure that we can still do that deep clean. Um, but I, I also need to need to have people understand. I, I think it's kind of unreasonable to expect everybody to tear down their their yeah. station, Absolutely. take it home, and then come in the next day and set it all up. So, um, they if they choose to do that and they want to do that, that's fine. But I can't have that as an expectation. Right. So so that would be an option. Right. So everybody has the option to either teach virtually from home on Wednesday or come in and teach from their classroom. Correct. Okay. Correct. And is this including office staff members as well? I mean, how's that going to work? So, John, I don't know if that got that specific in the plan as it relates to, obviously, the custodial staff would be there. You're going to expect to see most of our administrators uh, on that day because if there's people in the building, we, you know, we we need to have that support staff there. But we're trying to, well. We have figured out a plan for the, the clean so that we can hit the protocols for what we're supposed to do disinfectant wise. The idea is between the two cohorts, right, of kids. Um, so that that same sort of option is available to, to staff. 
correct. I think Ms. McCabe would say that she needs her school offices to have coverage on that day, right. but that doesn't mean that, you know, everybody would, would necessarily need to be in that space. And Mr. Prokop and his team will, you know, they'll figure it out like they always do. So where they, where they can clean during, where they can sanitize during the day, that's, that can occur and will occur on Wednesdays and for spaces that will have to wait until people, um, people vacate for the day, then that the sanit evening. sanitizing will occur later in, in the, in the afternoon or evening. Ed, there was a question for you about other counties. I think Ms. Herbert asked that. Yes. I, I was just curious, what are other, are there other counties doing this? Relative to, is a question. Yeah, I was, it's, it was it's, for Ed O'Malley. I'm sorry, John. Ed. What? Are, are you referring to uh, allowing the uh, children of staff coming yes. into the school? Yes, and, and with this daycare problem we have. Yes. Yes, there are some counties that are doing it. Okay. Oh, and the, okay. Mr. Amelie, the, the, the FFCRA um, rules, would they have to have uh, daycare at no charge or just daycare available and maybe pay a fee? Well, it's, it, 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 I, I don't think that it goes into that uh, level of detail, but uh, keep in mind, if we're going to be talking about charging staff, then we're going to be getting into a negotiable issue with the, uh, with the association. Okay. That's, yeah, that's why I was asking. Okay. Yeah. So um, that, that's a different <sighs> question entirely. Keep in mind also, and Mr. O'Neill mentioned this earlier, but it's an important point to keep it in the back of your mind. The Family First Coronavirus Response Act is a law that has a sunset provision of December 31st. Right. Yep. It may or may not get reauthorized. And even if it is reauthorized, if you use it now, it's only good for 12 weeks of leave. And then you have to wait an entire year before you can use it again. Now, if you use it two days this week and two days next week, those intermittent days get spread out a little bit further. But FFCRA is, is a finite chunk of leave. Uh, ADA is a very different matter. An ADA is accommodations to enable the person to perform the essential functions of the job. Uh, and that could be for the rest of a person's career, perhaps, uh, as long as it's not an undue hardship on the employer. I don't know if this is something the board wishes to entertain or not, but as we're looking at ideas, another, and this is just trying to get us as far along as possible as perhaps we could look at um, the, the time at which staff would report prior to the hybrid as a, as a potential consideration. Right now we have October 5th. Um, perhaps for some additional continuity, we could look at, a, you know, having that be a different date. Um, the, the following week, Friday, October 16th, we, that is a professional development day. That's going to be an important day as going to try to do some training along the way for the hybrid instructional model but that is our one professional development day in the fall um, and that's the day prior to the 19th um, and so that'll be a day when we'd want obviously everybody um, participating in that and like I said we're looking at some uh, additional training options along the way um, to, to get folks ready that's why we've started to talk about this now and we'll, we'll talk about uh, the, the hybrid instructional model in just a minute, but if that's if looking at that start date is something that potentially could help um, get us a little bit uh, closer. How, how can that be looked at? That's best for you and the central office staff. So so let's say schools are open October 19th, and and everybody had said teachers should report two weeks before. Um, what would you rather see? one week or or you're going to have training and set up the classroom and it's and flexibility during the two weeks what's what's the better answer right to, to because again I, i'd hate to see 
let's say if you say, well, you need to come into Thursday, Friday before, and you find out on Wednesday, then you've got 20 more people not coming in that you didn't think. You know, I don't want to prolong that, but what's, sure. what's the best way for you guys to do that? Because I think we're open. Frankly, we're open for whatever gets us open the best way possible, you know? But, but I, I don't want to do something that ties your hands more to try to accommodate uh, a, a, a relatively small percentage of the faculty. You know, I'm not sure. It's a great right, question. So if, if it's a week ahead, so if it's October 12th that they report, yeah, October, does that work? Yeah. Or is it a rotating schedule of they just have to come in two days before October 19th and it's a rotating schedule of, or, you know, something yeah, like that? Yeah, what's, I think, what's the best answer? Right, so I think flexibility is going to be key, right? Because it might be different for certain schools where maybe there isn't any any leave implications. I think we heard there are at least a handful of those. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I look to Cindy and maybe some of the uh, instructional directors uh, thinking from a principal lens. Uh, I do think that flexibility might be key. I think that a lot of people have obviously been in and many are working out of their classrooms at the schools I visited. Um, um, but, you know, maybe it is, you know, just a couple of days depending on the, the training needs um, and we know we have that, that Friday as a designated day. Everybody's schedules are a little bit different. And so principals can work around people's schedules and say, I need you on this day. We want to make sure we're ready to go with this. I, all I'm saying is I'm, I'm trying to look for a, a flexible way to help support Well, what if, support what if we said, okay, first day of school, October 19th. Mm -hmm. Technically, teachers report to the school buildings two weeks before October 5th. But... The number of days, the number of hours is is flexible per whatever the 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 the, the administration in the building, the central office, you guys come up with a schedule. In other words, you know, maybe you want maybe certain schools want them there a week before, but then other schools say, Yeah, if they're if their classroom's already set up because they've been there, right. who cares? I, I don't how how are we flex how do we not tie your hands? Because I you know, I I think to me, it's say, technically it's October 5th, but you guys do the best thing you can do to make us open on the 19th. Now, I don't know how you put that in motion. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that there's some flexibility in the discussion because I know we've received emails from some teachers who've been wondering, um, you know, why would we give a two week period of time for them to report to their classrooms because yep. as you just said some of them have already had their rooms set up for a while um, so I think um, you know if we can give some flexibility and again if we're saying the 16th is a day that we know that um, they're going to be involved if if we can just say whatever time they need to make sure that they're ready. I mean, I'd certainly be fine with that because, again, you know, we have to keep in mind that we are dealing with professionals and our folks have been working hard. In fact, we have received so many emails from folks who are putting in so much time from early morning to late at night, just trying to keep it all together and to, and to make it work um, for them and for their students. So I'd like to, you know, certainly honor the amount of time that they've already invested and again they've already shown that they're going to do all that they need to do to make sure that they're prepared for their classes so if we can give them that flexibility i would certainly be all for that and you know sort of get rid of that um two week um prior notice that we had in there um, again, we're in we're in dire times here. You know, we're in a situation we are going to be needing teachers. If everybody would get the leave that they've requested, we're we're really out on a limb. I mean, again, we've got to work with our um, professional staff um, and have them again continue to work with us. So let's just give them the flexibility and I'll get off that horse for a while. But again, I just want us to um, make sure that we're, we're honoring um, our professionals who've certainly been working very hard. And, and I agree, I think that's a great point. And, 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 and I have no doubt people are working 12 hours a day and like it or not in October, they may be working more. I mean, none of this gets easy until we're through this. But, but I don't want to tie administrators' hands either at the same time, you know? So do you guys, 
we, we need you and staff to write a nice motion for us. Sure. So, Cindy, I know you want to chime in here. Um, I, I would just say that while I don't think the two weeks are necessary, I think there is some necessary lead up time to um, um, to have um, staff in the school building before um, students return in a hybrid model. And, and that's just because there are a lot of logistical issues and concerns that go on in a school besides, um, you know, just what we've been doing so far. So far, teachers have been um, teaching virtually, but when we go back in the hybrid model, there's a lot to be considered as far as um, student movement throughout the building, um, how lunch lunches will be structured and monitored, um, recess, um, students switching classes um, versus teachers um, moving into other classes during the day. There's there's just a lot of logistical issues that um, that we'll want to to work out. So I think that we will need some lead up time. Certainly not the two weeks. Um, and I think it would be um, the best option if if all schools had the same amount of days or lead up time to work with their staff. So one, and one week? Some of the discussions can be held virtually, right? Um, yes. As far as their planning um, is concerned. They can yes. be. And don't forget, during that time, people are teaching. Yes. So it's, it's not like they got a lot of meeting time sitting around. Um, right. So I think I'd recommend, you know, that while, you know, we're going to, we're going to say starting October 5th, um, and maybe it's as, as easy as at the discretion of the principal in terms of when they need to meet with folks, whether that's in person, virtually, or we need you here because we got to get the room arranged or the markings down or what, well, a lot of that's already done, but the, those kinds of logistical house, housekeeping things at the discretion of the, of the principal. Um, but again, we'll have to be careful because that you know that that's going to have to be done on a, a planning t you know a, a time where folks aren't involved with students um and so we, we have to we have to be cognizant of the fact that they're teaching the whole time um and i would ask from an hr standpoint where is the staff meeting be required to physically report if they are going to apply for one of the available leaves to please let us know by october the 5th so that we can plan as much as possible I thought you had said earlier it was September 30th, Chantress. It, it, it is September 30th, but if we're going to back up with them physically reporting, then I was going to give them the extra week. Well, but I, I think we need to know no, by the we 30th. Need, we need um, to know by the 30th. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. Is the board comfortable with that direction for um, prior to the 19th when the hybrid would begin that will give the principals the flexibility to work with staff? Mm -hmm. for when they need them to physically report. Obviously, you know, um, there's going to be certain things we're going to need folks available for, um, right. but it's going to vary building to building. It's also going to vary on, uh, you know, what the, what the leave looks like in certain schools as we're mm -hmm. planning to try to figure that puzzle out. Right. So on, are we saying that basically on paper it's the fifth, but we're giving, yes. giving folks the flexibility that they need to make it work? And with the board's permission, I'd also like to pursue um, further looking at the the em employee child care provision that we talked about yes, and definitely. see what options are available there. Right. Definitely. Okay. Can can we spend a few minutes talking about the hybrid instructional model? Yeah. So yep. let me set Please. the let me set the stage. Okay. Back when we first talked about a a, a plan. Long ago, it seems like in <laughs> pandemic years, you know, five years ago, um, but it was early summer. And initially when we looked at the hybrid model, we talked about um, students would be asynchronous. In other words, they wouldn't see their teachers on the times they weren't in school. And the, the kids who were all virtual originally were only gonna see their teachers on Wednesdays. The, we had a lot of conversation here as a board and the board said, we're not really comfortable with that because we feel like, you know, two days a week of seeing your teacher just isn't enough. So we started to work on that. 
And then lo and behold, the state came along and said, you must now in your plans, whether you're all virtual or hybrid, you must have three and a half hours average of synchronous instruction a day. Dr. Locker, is that average or it has to be per day? It, it, it is an average, um, but so if they see the teachers all day for two days, does that help that? It helps a little bit for the cohorts. It does not help for the, the virtual students. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, I did some math. It, it doesn't quite get to the three and a half hour average, even with the two days. It's close. But here's, the, here's what we're also trying to avoid. We're also trying to avoid to say to teachers, all right, well, you're going to have these kids all day for two days. And then you got to figure out what you're going to do to get three and a half hours with these kids that don't come in until the B cohort. And then you got to figure out what you're going to do for three and a half hours for the all virtual kids. And so we try to develop with, I, th I believe, and I know it looks overwhelming to people. And listen, let me be the first one to add to what I've heard tonight to say how in incredible I think our teachers have done. Um, I've seen it on the virtual lessons that are being delivered. I've visited in-person classrooms and I've seen some people doing the hybrid model already in some of these places that I've visited in person in the past week. Um, our, our teachers are doing incredible work and we, we would never have pulled this off without the innovation, dedication, hard work. Um, they, 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 they have done it and I know it looks overwhelming when you see oh here's the next thing we're going to do um, but I know that we'll work through that I know that we'll guide I know that we'll help I know that we have people out there who can help us and I don't expect it to be perfect on day one um, but I also don't expect people to try to teach three different really three different cohorts of kids three and a half hours a day each and so we tried to put a framework in place that allows kids in the class and kids who are not there to be able to be a part of the class. Um, and I get that's hard. Um, I get that that's going to be challenging. Um, I think we can do it, um, but, but we're also required to. Um, and I'm also open to ideas, and I've told people if there's a better idea out there, and we're given a lot of autonomy and I think flexibility within in that day we're not saying you must do it like this exactly whatever we're just saying we've got to try to include kids who aren't in school into that instruction so they and we want to keep kids on a schedule one of the things i've heard about this year's virtual um, learning is that it's scheduled it's structured um, and we don't want to lose that because at some point i'd like to have everybody come back and we're still in that schedule and the schedule's been working like, it, it, you can see it, even with the first graders, how incredible it is, how they, you know, I gotta get back on at 12, 15. Like, they, they know what they're expected to do, and it, that part is incredible. And so I am not dismissing the fact that, yes, it'll be challenging, or it's, it's not gonna be without its frustration, but I, I think we can do that. And I, I also would say we're always, open and willing to look at additional ideas and suggest that's why we kind of left some space um, and are, are providing this way ahead of time so people can start to work through it Jason do you want to talk a little bit about that you know Dr. Lockwood you, you said it well you visited a lot of schools that Nick and I spent a lot of time in over the last couple of weeks um, and quite honestly we, we we listened to the teachers that were doing it um, they intuitively began to do this that is, this was a perfect example of teachers teaching students in their room, but they also had some students they were responsible for at home. And so we naturally, they naturally started to teach their students at home while they were teaching students in the room. Incredibly difficult to do. Um, you need the assistance. If you have instructional assistance in your room, you must use them to keep kids on task. Um, but what we did is we learned from the teachers and we took that feedback from those teachers and we listened to what was the good and what was the bad and what was difficult. We also spent some time visiting many schools and looked at how the schools were set up and principals shared, here's where the teaching station will be and here's where the, the desk will be. And so then we started thinking about, okay, so if 
teachers are limited to a certain area in their classroom because we need to remain our distance, then we're gonna do our best to be able to instruct students in the room as well as at home because we were very clear on the board direction of 50% synchronous instruction and it was unsatisfactory to think that we'd only have one day for those students that were completely virtual. Um, we pulled up with some principals. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Tierney, uh, Mr. Lavender, Mr. Gantz, um, as well as our tech service team, Sharon Miner. Um, and so we sat down as a team listening to the teacher feedback and said, here's, here's a technical solution. Here's, here's a potential solution. It's not a mandate, but what we we're trying to do is to create an environment where the teacher feels comfortable being able to project as well as present um, through Google Classroom. And that was a huge lift. And technically, we did come up with a solution. And that's what, that's what was sent out was best practices for a hybrid instruction. And so um, we shared this with principals two days ago that we were going to be attempting to share this. And we knew how, how it was going to be received in many cases. Um, because, you know, it's difficult to teach kids virtually, number one. It's difficult to teach kids while they're in the room. So to, to ask both of them, it's, it's, it just makes the job even harder. And so what we did then is um, we put together some best practices. We shared that with principals. And, and to no surprise, this is a huge shift, just like it was when we moved to Enhanced Virtual. And we spent a lot of time thousands of hours of professional learning over the summer to build the capacity of people to be able to do this well. And it's going to take time for people to take these best practices and these ideas and to do their best with it. Um, it's going to be difficult to have students that are home all the time, five days a week, and then you're going to have a couple kids in two days a week and the other half two days a week. And so to manage that as a teacher, um, it's an enormous task. And so we're not oversimplifying it, we're not downplaying it. What we were attempting to do is to provide a solution based on board direction as well as the state mandate now and the expectations rather of the board and the state mandate of being able to teach kids um, that are in the room as well as at home. Um, because we can't go uh, two straight days without a student seeing their teacher um, if we just went asynchronous on those two days when they're not in the building. And we would so not that, that's where we're at right now. Right. Is there any flexibility in those numbers from the state? I mean, the state put those out when most of the school systems or all of the school systems are saying we're going 100% virtual on day one. So I mean, that was part of what it was kind of intended for. Is there any leniency when you go to a hybrid model to try to figure this out? As so, we go. As Dr. Yeah, as Dr. Lockhart said, you know, as far as the students working virtual, our, our, our direction has been that they should be receiving three and a half hours a day on average of synchronous instruction. Um, the, that's, that's the hardest lift for our teachers because we do know that if we're bringing in students in a hybrid environment, the power of that is having, as Ms. Vitaglia mentioned earlier, the relationship. You're providing more attention to the students that are in your room. And so that's where we kind of started with our plan um, of saying, well, those days that students aren't in the building, they're going to get asynchronous activities. But then we heard some feedback, you know, from the board as well, saying that, you know, that's that's not acceptable. And and so that's a long time for kids not having some direct instruction. So even if we did have some flexibility, President Savigny, um, I know that Tom uh, Hill, myself, um, we looked at, OK, well, how is the schedule going to change? Right because when we, we, we chose middle school because that seemed like the biggest difference. And I don't know if Tom's on the call right now, but what we, what we, what we have to essentially do is um, move our schedule from um, uh, our enhanced virtual to a traditional schedule. And Tom, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about our meeting that we had and, and how, we're, how we potentially could look at the synchronous time being at different, different times during that block. Sure, Jason. Um, one of the things that we looked at was that one of the important pieces is the structure of the school once we go hybrid. All of the pieces have to be there. The lunch shifts have to run. Um, the time in between, there is going to be class change in some classes and others were trying to minimize it. But the, the school has to operate as a school, whether half of the students are there or all of them are there. So we looked at when students are in school in the hybrid model, 
how we can give the teacher the autonomy to be able to set up that three and a half hours because some lessons, the beginning of the class, may be the best asynchronous time. Other times they're going to work on the project from the day before and maybe in an hour class, the last half hour would be the best part of the day. Teachers are going to need to communicate that and those kind of things. I, I wanted to make sure they had the autonomy to do what they need to do. There, there are so many different classes between kindergarten and a senior in high school that providing them that autonomy is, is really important to being able to do the model and, and deliver the best education we can for kids. Thanks for that, Tom. And thanks for that guidance. And, and, and like you said, sometimes in the, the best time of synchronous instruction may be the closure to Tom's point rather than the opening direct instruction um, for, the, for the class period. Mr. Anderson, how much asynchronous works are the students supposed to have a day? Was there any type of matrix laid out for that? Yeah, so, so basically what we were supposed to do, and, and it's basically based on COMA, we're supposed to be shooting for that, that 30 hours plus of, of instruction a week, right? So you have to go ahead and do the math. So if you figure out, okay, we're looking at six hours a day and you're doing three and a half hours of synchronous, well, ultimately, you know, the math works out where you're doing, you know, the other two and a half of asynchronous. And so that asynchronous looks very different, though, um, because um, the task, as we've all heard through many emails, is for some students, it takes longer to complete a task than it does others. So we have to be sensitive to that as well. So you can see the juggling act that teachers are doing based on ability of students in, in one course. And, and so they're trying to figure out how do we how do we keep the work workload manageable? Um, and that's why you're seeing um, teachers working 12, 14 hours a day. Um, I live with one that that's doing that right now. And, and it's really just trying to figure out how to meet the needs of all of our students. We have a number of students that we're still trying to figure out how to get them content through a flash drive um, because they don't have connectivity. And so we, we download content, we provide flash drives so they can get it on their computer without needing connectivity um, at home. And those would be the students that would benefit more from the hybrid model than yeah, and to President Savigny's comment earlier, you know, what are other thoughts? You know, we, you know, those are the kids I'm really worried about also overseeing equities are students that lack the access and the connectivity to maintain the pacing um, necessary to do well. Um, Mr. Anderson, um, yeah. I'm not being a bad guy here, but I just know I was a teacher, okay? Yeah. And I started getting emails last night about, yeah. about, this what was going on and i didn't have any idea what was really going on because we were given no information before this and i didn't know what the world these teachers were talking to us about a hybrid uh teaching zone and when i got an email from a veteran teacher and i'm going to use her name and i'm sure it's fine i've talked to i talked to her um kate browning is 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 a uh kindergarten teacher, so is Miss Hen. And um, I've talked to them and they said uh, that they don't know how they can do this with kindergartners. And, I, and I'm just being a realist when you've got- No, you are, a bit, you are. I mean, you've Mr. got 10 little kids sitting six feet apart. And I know for a fact at Manchester Elementary last week, she had a, uh, another teacher had the little boy put scissors in his mouth and cut his mouth and uh, taking care of that. And here you are trying to teach online yeah. and then you've got that. Um, I, I would, uh, I just don't know how, I, I feel my heart goes out to these teachers. It really does. I think it's gonna be really difficult uh, for, some, for some grades. I, I, I really do mean that and especially, uh, kindergarten and first grade, I'm, they're doing the best they can. I think when this email came out, it was a total surprise because what we had been talking about in the past and what they did their in-service about online and then being told overnight that they were gonna have to do both at the same time. I just think they needed to know ahead of time or give them a little bit of heads up uh, I, I don't know if they were given a heads up, but um, and I asked if I could read this from another teacher, but never in my wildest dreams did I expect 
or plan to teach both formats simultaneously. And then I understood what a hybrid teaching is, unable to walk away from my computer. Um, you know, that's just not a best practice. I wish I had a wand uh, or we could do a camera or something. Uh, I, I don't know, but I, I really feel bad for these teachers that they are going to have to stay in front of a computer for hours on end, and then you've got the classroom students there that you want to be face to face with. I, right. I, I don't think I'm crazy, and they just, and she said, we're being asked to build the plane in flight. So I, I, I just don't know what else we can do. I think they were kind of like, surprised that we, they were going to have to do both at the same time. And I know we have that three and a half hours we got to get in every day. Right. Let me, so let I me hope respond. we can do some things on that. Let me Help respond. Help me out, Dr. Locker. Absolutely. Uh, I'm just concerned about our teachers. Sure. So <laughs> once, once we were required um, by the state right. with the average, it left us very little choice. Mm -hmm. The reason that we began and started working with all these people to try to get something going here is because we wanted to make sure by giving it to them now, and we haven't even done the training, we just <laughs> wanted to put that out there right. to start. Okay, so we have almost a month. Um, so it's not like we're expecting them right. to start the hybrid tomorrow. I right. didn't want to give it to them on the first week of school because okay. I wanted them to all be right. focused on okay. the all, all virtual. The training this summer was get ready for the all virtual. Right. That training for the all virtual is going to help right. with this next piece for sure. And I get it, especially you're, you you hit the nail on the head. Pre-K, K, first grade, oh. you name it. That's where when you heard Jason talk about if you have available IAs or anybody else who can help. Now, I don't expect teachers to stand in front of their computer in a first grade classroom the entire time. It's ideal if you, hey, everybody, I've got some instruction I want to provide. <laughs> You guys can see me here, and my class can see me here. That's where I want to be. Thank you. But I might need to leave. And, and one of the classes I saw, the kids were projected on the screen. So the teacher didn't necessarily have to be in front of their computer all the time. Good. I um, they just needed to be able to be heard, and they needed to be able to look up and go, oh, I see, you know, Dr. Dorsey has a question, and I can call on her um, because she, okay. she put her hand up, and I could see that from wherever I was in the room. Right. Yeah. So there is flexibility yeah. built into that. Good. I think the time between now and, you know, mid to late October is going to be, we got to unpack all this. We got to right. work they through it. To we got to figure that's it out. Right. And that's why we didn't wait any longer. I get at some point that that Band-Aid hurts when it comes off, and I'm not downplaying that at all. It, it's, I, it, they were I, shocked. I, I said, said it I, just, I They really were. And, like, I just, I just can't imagine me teaching kindergarten. You know, with this. Well, right can now. you imagine doing it all virtually either? Yeah, right, no, right, we right. can't. Oh, yeah. Oh, so. my golly days. I talked to Miss Hen. They're dancing in front of it and all that. But I will tell you one thing that Manchester Elementary is doing, and I got to give kudos to it. They are out there every other Friday handing out packets to every parent, teaching them, cut this out, paste this out. I was there. I saw it. So they are going above and beyond. And as yeah. I said hey, at the beginning, hang on one more. <laughs> as, as I said at the beginning, too, we're going to lean on our teachers for for ideas to we we have all along through all virtual we'll lean on them for this too we are mandated to hit the requirement and yes. so i do get that there's not enough hours in the day and i don't expect them like i said at the beginning to do we're going to do your three and a half hours now and then your three and a half hours now and your three and a half hours now <laughs> I it's, know. Not, it's not going to work and, um, and i think you said flexibility i don't know how many times Everybody, uh, Dr. Dorsey just said it probably the most. We got great teachers that are jumping to it. Oh, I know. Both of you guys said we've been asking teachers, we've been doing this, and, and I understand the shock, but I don't, and I'm probably the same way in, in my world, but and that's the first thing I thought. They got three and a half weeks. And everybody said we're gonna be flexible, so let let's learn it and do it. And I know it's like being in school two weeks ahead of time, it's like, well, why do we have to do that? We don't want to, well, you need to plan. And, you know, we're trying to do it well. And I even look at stuff like 
our school calendar. We put our school calendar and say you've got 60 plus days to get us comments on it. And, and the first comment is, I can't believe you did that. Well, we didn't yet. Right. You know, <laughs> let, let's, we want to talk, we want input and we want to talk about it, but it's so hard to make that point to everybody. Right. And, and, and it's part of it. I mean, we're in a pandemic. It's weird times. Everybody's on edge, but. Well, let's look um, back at some of the emails we have when we started talking about virtual, what we're going to do for the fall. A lot of the emails like, how, how do you expect me to do this? I can't do this. This is going to be difficult. And then, you know, okay, now we've, we're, we're working in and we're learning and we're working on it. And now we got the hybrid. And all of a sudden now, again, you expect me to do this. This is going to be hard. I can't do this. This is difficult. Yeah. I think we, we need to, the positivity has got to stay ahead. We, you know, we, we keep telling our families that too. Like if you give your kids the positivity, like it's going to be okay. We'll make it work the same thing will go. And, and that's the one thing we have to keep going, moving ahead on. We'll make it work. Never say you can't. What can you do? And, and, and the of, teachers, oh, go ahead. And some of the guidelines coming down to you guys comes about two days after we've made a decision. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't <laughs> and, forget that was less than the <laughs> three weeks ago that yes, we got that. Yes, so. yes. Yep. <laughs> Ms. Herbert, I, I, I can't agree more. Um, <laughs> I am. Um, I just feel bad. Ms. Herbert, I just wanted to say um, I can't agree more how difficult this is going to be, especially with our youngest learners. Mm. Um, I'm going to call on Nick just real quick. You know, we saw some amazing hybrid instruction taking place with first graders, not necessarily kindergartners, mm. um, <laughs> of, of some models that were, <laughs> we're talking a year difference, but we, right. we did see it take place. and. It wasn't done at a computer necessarily. It was done at a kidney table with reading groups. And the teacher turned to the station to check in with parents and kids. But Nick, you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, good, good evening, board members. Yeah, our, our special educators uh, have been doing a, a, a fantastic job. They've been in our special programs providing some in-person support since the beginning of last week. And, uh, and just like Mr. Anderson had said, our, you know, they, they've adapted to this environment. And for many special educators, this was their, their preference. Um, when we were kind of determining our staff, there were a few folks who were on the fence as to, you know, as to whether or not they were going to do this. But one of the things they said, look, it's really important to us that we can teach both um, our students on our caseloads that we um, both in person and virtually because and it gets back to that relationship piece, especially in special education where there's a very in-depth knowledge of our students that are developed over time. Um, so it was really important, but it was very fascinating to see. Um, the, you know, and I'm certain, and, and again, this was early in, in, in this process, and I'm certain they'll refine it over time, but they found very unique ways to engage both the kids in front of them, along with the kids virtually. They were using those support staff, those instructional assistants, those student support assistants. You could tell that there was an established flow of groups and rotations within the, within the classroom. Um, and you could also tell that they were well planned and, and, you know, good teaching starts with good planning. Um, so they had really put all the pieces together to, to make that work, but it was very powerful to see. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful for our special educators and, 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 and the, all of the staff in special education who's been working uh, so hard to make this work in person for our kids. But very powerful, very engaging, um, and our kids seem fine with it. Our kids in person, you know, were, 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 were working, and, and again, whether they were direct with the teacher, whether they were with their assistant, we saw it done a couple different ways, and that's where that flexibility comes into play. Um, I'm certain there are times where the teachers might be working with all the kids collectively. And then again, there might be times where we're breaking out um, within the classroom, having a group set to the side, along with maybe just some time with the virtuals. But you could also see that there was checking for understanding, all good teaching. So um, those things that we do both virtually and in person can happen in that, in that blended uh, hybrid environment. It's a lot of work. Yeah. Yes, and that's that's the one thing I am worried about. And I'm telling you, our te our teachers are really working hard. And you know, that's just one more thing. And you know, I'm it's it's tough. It it really is. And I, my heart goes out to them too. And Dr. Lockard, you had said that October 16th is a professional development day. Is that going to be the primary focus of the professional development on that day? Is is working through the, the logistics of a hybrid model or not necessarily? Cindy. Um, so 
That professional development day um, is one that's scheduled for uh, school-based administrators uh, to use with their staff. Um, Mr. Anderson and myself have been um, have been communicating with directors and principals about that day and what uh, could possibly be offered on that day. So um, at least part of the day will be utilized for looking at this hybrid uh, model. Um, we, Mr. Anderson's folks have put together a slide deck that we'll be using um, uh, with our staff. That's the slide deck that, that some of you have seen that have gone out to schools. Um, and they will also, teachers will also have time, specific time, to touch base with their content supervisors. Uh, Mr. Anderson, do you want to add to that? Yeah, that's, thanks, Cindy, for, for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. So that day, um, the reason why, as Dr. Lockhart said, we got it out earlier, um, and Ms. Herbert's point was to give people time to consume it and digest it and be like, is this possible? How is this going to be possible? When we get to the 16th, we certainly didn't want to drop it on them at that time and say, guess what? In three days, we need you to do this. Um, what, what's going to happen, as Cindy just, Ms. McCabe just said, was that on the 16th, there's going to be blocks of time where the content supervisors will be available to teachers for virtual types of capacity building on how to, how to basically make this model work content specific. And so maybe that is a lab situation, right? Maybe that is a, when, when they're working, you know, in a different type of course that, that typically that, you know, this is going to be a little bit more difficult having half of my kids in the room now with half of my kids at home and I need to keep their pace the same. The, the, the biggest challenge that I'd like to just make clear to the board is that the state made it very clear to us that we there is no waiver to, to the, the, the college and career readiness standards and it, we are responsible for covering all content as we've historically covered in a year. And so, you know, teachers are working like they've never worked before to make sure that students are mastering those standards. And Dr. Lockard, when you said you had visited some hybrid classrooms, was it the same ones that, that Mr. Shockney was talking about? No. Um, oh, gosh. Where was I? A couple of them were, Dr. Lockard. Yeah. You went to Winfield. You went to Winfield. Yeah. 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 Westminster uh, High. Westminster, right. Okay. There's a couple different places. Yeah. That's, that seems like forever ago, and it wasn't. <laughs> So I mean, just from a from a logistical standpoint, so so they're going to be the teachers are going to be getting some direction, and they're going to be seeing some things in practice. You know how to make a hybrid model work, but they're they're not going to be required to literally stand in a zone, right? Like there needs to they need to be able to get out there in front of their kids. They need to, and and they're going to be allowed to walk up to individual students, right? I mean, they wouldn't be violating the. No. six foot 15 minute rule if they're walking over and helping a child oh. in the class with a problem of course not we're, we're just trying to provide some some suggestions and ideas for how they can allow kids into their classroom virtually mm -hmm. and so one of the suggestions you hear the the what do they call it the virtual zone or whatever it's called it look here's a good idea if you're getting ready to talk to the whole class this will be a good place for you to be um so that the camera and we Nick illustrated and Jason did two examples of how a teacher could set up at a at a small group table to do reading groups for younger students. How I could have the virtual kids on the screen and I could walk around the room and still see them. They can still hear me. You know, you have the question. I can see you have your hand up. Mm -hmm. um, so they don't necessarily have to be standing in front of the of the computer all day long to do that. I could move to another part of the room. Now, granted, we have microphones, so we'll have to figure out what's the best place where everybody can hear me. Um, but if I come out of the picture just a little bit, kids can, you can probably still hear me at home um, talking. If I moved over here to, to assist Ms. Battaglia, if I moved over here, you know, and I can also, if I'm projecting, I could see them on the screen as well. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. And there's even wireless mics if somebody wants to yeah. move oh. around more. Right? It's, it's, this is not easy, and uh, and it's going to take the whole team. It is. It One is. thing I did get a phone call from a teacher from. Um, there was concerns about how the the learning is going to be. Like, you know, how can you expect? And it was the question was how can you expect kids to not bring their computer and they're going to have to do pencil and paper and, and can COVID spread on that? And I said, like, well, 
number one, we haven't heard any of that, so I don't know. I said number two, from what I understood, everything was going to remain on Google Classroom. Like, whatever class you were in, whatever hybrid, it was still going to be there with Google Classroom. So I don't know where that miscommunication automatically came out into the, the email, but um, Mr. Anderson, could you clarify that? Well, I somewhere? think it's a question for Ms. McCabe. Okay. And she and I have actually been having some conversation around this a, as well as it relates to some of the initial recommendations about um, how we best manage the technology coming back and forth between schools for students and whether we, we we just have to be careful there. We don't want to create a situation for ourselves. So Cindy, maybe you could talk a little bit about some of the initial thinking and then also some of the future thinking. Yeah, so um, you know, our, our initial thinking with technology is, um, as you know, we've given out all of our laptops now um, to students. So we don't have any uh, left over. So we, we do have to be concerned about um, students bringing laptops back and forth to school each day um, when we think about um, possible loss, um, something being stolen, something uh, being broken. Um, we have not given out any kind of carrier for the laptops or any way to, to secure them uh, from home and school and, and back and forth. Um, and because we don't have anything in reserve to give a student, if, if they were to lose it, break it, something like that, I'm not sure what we would be able to do. Um, the other issue that, that, we're, that we're dealing with is if we bring laptops back into the hybrid classroom, we have thousands of students who are not using our devices. They're using their own uh, laptops. And so um, in that case, we may have students back in the classrooms who um, are unable to connect to our network or not sure um, what to do when everyone else in the classroom who has one of our laptops is doing something in a certain way. What we're trying to avoid is, putting, is also putting extra work on the teacher to be a technology expert in the classroom with the students. We, we don't have a tech person for every school. Um, and so the teacher, we want to make sure that when the teacher is front of it, in front of the students that, um, that they're focused on instruction and not taking time out of the class to help students um, with the technology. And then there's the issue of uh, power. We don't have, you know, we don't have the ability to power up all the laptops while we're there and things like that. So, so any of the issues that we would think of in a BYOB policy, we, we would really have to consider when we think about students uh, bringing laptops into the school for hybrid instruction. Now, one of the things that I've recommended is I would like to see our secondary students be able to, to, to do that. And you remember we have ordered laptops for all of our high school students my expectation is going to be that they get to bring those back and forth like they would a textbook. And the expectation would be that they're charged before they come to school so everybody's not scrambling for a plug. Mm -hmm. um, so shortly, my hope is that we'll be able to move more and more to be able to do that. It kind of defeats the purpose if I'm doing... I, I just feel like for our secondary students, that needs to be an option soon. Um, I, I get right now, I don't want to risk... I don't want to risk setting us back or having teachers have to be technical troubleshooters, um, but I also think, particularly in the next, in the short, in this very short future, we're, we're going to have a whole lot more at our disposal, and I think that creates a, a, a lot more opportunity um, for our students and for then ultimately our teachers. Yes, we expect our laptop order to come in in November, and if that happens. Um, and we are able to get to one-to-one uh, -to -one at the high school level with our laptops, then that does open up uh, more possibilities. But to your original question, Ms. Battaglia, yes, they'll still, when they're, they're, 
whether they're using computers at school or whether they're back home when they're not on the cohort days, they are logging right back into the same Google Classroom and following. And when they go home in the evenings, if they're there during the day, all that'll be there uh, as well. So that doesn't change. But they will be completing paper pencil um, assignments while in school. We've, we work with uh, Mr. Singer. It's you know surface contact, he said, is not of great concern. Kindergarten rooms will still have centers and stations. Um, and paper, just like our mail, there, it's it's you know it's something that we're gonna we're gonna work work with. At Career and Tech right now, and that was a very happy place to see those kids back there and the teachers back there. So they they have um, students come Monday and Tuesday, then they don't come Wednesday, and then we have another group Thursday come Friday. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So are they on virtual the days? they're not in class or how's that working yeah. i don't know in yeah i mean i i can i can speak to it but i'm sure miss mccausland's on right now or, or mr eccles but i'll let them let them pick it up here um if uh if i don't know if they're still on um the answer is yes so instruction continues just like it does they're they're essentially running our hybrid model right now um, I, I, I was just curious because i know um they were in there sweeping floors and doing brick stuff, and I thought, how 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 do you how do you do that? So, I'm sure that I guess they figured it out. Ms. McCall, do you want to talk about what what a Wednesday would look like for those students? Yeah, I mean, typically students are always preparing for their industry certification tests and and what they need to do to to prepare to take those. So, virtual instruction would continue on Wednesdays. Um, different kinds of content. I know that like. Um, our Cosmo teachers will do a lot of videos and upload them on different types of techniques for cutting hair and, and those types of things. Um, but I was uh, thinking as well of, as other programs. I was thinking of uh, you have one group that comes on Monday and Tuesday, then you have your virtual, which I understand, and then you have another group come on Thursday and Friday. So on on the Monday and Tuesday group, do they watch what goes on in class Thursday and Friday, or what do they do? So right now, no. What, no. Okay, because right. it's so hands-on, and it that's is. what it says. It is, and all they'd be doing is watching. Um, right. Oh, but they were so happy. But I, yeah, I know, and uh, <laughs> I, I visited, and I know that. Uh, I beat you. I, that I talked day. with one of the instructors over there, who said the other students are, as Miss McCausland said, they they were doing some, uh, uh, some sequence online of of some some aspect of their course okay, to prepare just... for certification i, I just which couldn't one it think was. that they would get a lot out of watching somebody sweep a floor and then set up more bricks or yeah. something or yeah. salt no mr herbert so so the instructors are focusing on the students that are in the school Good. and the students who are awesome. virtual are doing asynchronous assignments sure uh, uh, yeah. they were that was a happy place i will tell you that yeah. and we're looking to phase in additional programs miss herbert in, in the weeks ahead so yep. it's going to yeah. get happier <laughs> they were all they were all very very happy those Get even happier. girls they or whoever all of them were happy <laughs> Thank you all. Can I just ask a real quick question? Um, I, I've gotten several questions from kindergarten teachers um, because they're they're not understanding like what their room is going to look like. Um, you know, like I heard Dr. Lockard, you and both uh, Mr. Shockney talk about the the kidney tables. Um, you know, kidney shaped tables that, that tend to be in the kindergarten classrooms. And, and I've heard stories of those all being taken out and being replaced by individual desks um, in the kindergarten classrooms. And that, that's not really how kindergarten Get teachers yeah. tend to teach classes. So is it possible for the, the K teachers to use their kidney tables rather than the individual desks? They can use them as long as the students are appropriately spread out. So on, for example, um, and Nick, you can speak to what you saw. One on one end, one on the other, and maybe one in the middle if you've got the if you've got the six feet. Um, I think that's kind of what you observed, right, Nick? Correct. That's exactly yeah. what I saw. And then I then there were some students, uh, you know, at, at different stations in the classroom with the teacher um, as well. Okay. With assistance, excuse me. Assistance. Yeah. Okay, so that is possible for a K teacher to say, well, they wanted at least one or two of the kidney tables in, mm -hmm. in their room in order to be able to use those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then the other things that I had heard were from PE teachers not understanding really how, how PE was going to work. I didn't, um, didn't even want to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> 
So. Does that hit too close to, to home, <laughs> Mrs. Herbert? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, no, I wasn't gonna. Uh, wasn't gonna bring it up. <laughs> right. Uh, so, um, uh, with that, uh, President Savigny, we have um, uh, uh, protocols, cleaning protocols of equipment for our arts as well. Um, that have been recently just run through our directors of schools today um, to give us final okay. And that will be coming out from our content supervisors. Jason, I think um, she was referring to, were you referring to hybrid instruction or are you yeah, referring to? Yeah, hybrid and, instruction. And, hi high and hybrid yeah. for, for I'm, I, I'm right. sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So in some cases, there may have to be a skill, skill uh, concept uh, of how, how, how you model it that you're recording, the teacher's recording it and then posting it because they certainly can't take their document camera or their computer out to the field or outside. We don't expect that. So it could be a three minute video on a screencastify or, or whatever they wanna choose to do, simply just record themselves doing this, the skill and post that online so students can see that. They're gonna get a chance to practice it, obviously when they come in. Yeah. Okay, so, so in the hybrid model, kids would be going to the the gyms. In mm -hmm. school, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. And the, okay, and so because they'll be socially distanced, and they can use the equipment, like there. So there's all the protocol for sanitizing everything, and okay. yes. Okay. And and Miss McCabe said earlier that you've got permission to use cafeteria too. Right, Cindy. You recently talked with Ed Singer about that. That's neat. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and North Carroll still had two gyms. <laughs> oh my. Dr. Locker. Yes, sir. Um, the motion that was originally made said schools start on the 19th. The last phrase was teachers will be required to be in the buildings beginning October 5th. Do you want us to make a motion and modify that, or did we talk enough tonight that? That, that everybody understands the flexibility that's added to it, or do you want us to, to do something formal? Um, so maybe I'll ask our, our attorney, mm -hmm. Mr. O'Mealy, if we need to uh, adjust that motion. You do. <laughs> you don't want to think it over? <laughs> no, no. You, you, you voted on it once, yes. so if you change it you have to vote on it now okay uh, and uh, uh, maybe bring it up under new business or you want to modify the agenda and and vote on it now but you do need to vote okay okay you're, you're modifying uh, something that was previously adopted by the board in public session so it requires a vote okay. all right so mr. Kyler did you want to take a, a shot at that motion <laughs> <laughs> He's good at that. Well, since you have it in front of you. Yep. Yeah. I'm fine with saying it's, teachers will be required in the buildings beginning October 5th. Um, the period of time from October 5th to the 15th, because the 16th is a mm -hmm. service day, will be flexible time um, coordinated with administrators. Does that cover it? Yep. The teachers are requested to report on October 5th, but um, flexibility is allowed at, at the discretion of the administrator and or is that individual um, teachers and individual teachers um, situations? That's um, fine. President Civic, may I say something, please? Sure. Yes. Uh, we have we're trying desperately to continue to expand our our specialized um, instructional programs. Um, and if we adjust this, then it could, um, at some at some level, at some time, limit us from from expanding our programming. Um, so that's just something I, I wanted to share. I don't know, Nick. Do you want to speak speak more specifically to that? Sure, uh, board members. And, and just a, something to keep in mind: we we were we were targeting the week of of, of, of October fifth. Uh, um, probably later in the week um, to, to expand to bring in our, our next uh, uh, set of special programs, which would be our Learning for Independence program, um, that we were hoping to start that towards the end of uh, to, towards the end of that first week. So uh, just something to consider as you're as you're revising your motion, if that if that's something you would still like, you know, to happen 
um, that week. Um, but we were trying to get a head start for, for that, that special program um, a little bit before the 19th to give those students some time um, individually with their, with their teachers. Nick, wouldn't that be considered, though, outside of the, the general teaching population that we're ta already talking about, though? I mean, I don't want it, it, to, I don't want it to inhibit that. No, I, that's why I'm saying I don't, um, I almost wish we didn't have to modify it, but because I think we all know what the intention is. So maybe, maybe the, just the end of the motion is with the exception of specialized programs already in, yeah. in, 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 set. Yeah, already in scheduled or, right. Right. Yes. right. So, so the period of time from October 5th to October 15th will be, will be flexible with approval of administrators and how do you want to say any existing right. supervisors? Um, An special program expansion programs. of special programs right yeah right. yep Does that that cover it like yes, I say sir. we don't want to tie anybody's we want to try to make this easier I, I don't think that's possible Cindy does that also work <laughs> for administrators and we can provide some guidance to them as follow-up yeah we I think it, I think it will work as long as the principals have the flexibility um, to do what they need to do to make sure schools are ready to open in hybrid. Yep. Um, and then we can follow up more with directors and principals um, so that everybody's on the same page. Good. Yeah. Okay. So the motion sounds something like, or not something like, <laughs> we'll say, um, so teachers are requested to report on October 5th with flexibility given to administrators to handle individual teacher circumstances and with no intended impact on special programs already in progress. Yep, you got it. Good. So okay. moved. Hope somebody got it. <laughs> Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay, seconded by Ms. Battaglia. Board members, any other comments or revisions that we want to make to that? And that's with us going starting October 19th. Mr. Emile, yes. we cover it? Ed, are we good? If, if uh, yes, I'm sorry. That with was, that wording, we're good. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay. All right. Then, with that, I will call for the vote. All those in favor, can I get a verbal aye, please? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Anything else on? Um, the COVID-19 update discussions with regard to uh, employee leave or the hybrid model or anything like that? Okay. Just I think we're going to be very happy to get things moving mm -hmm. and learn to live with it. Right. Yeah, I, just, I just want to thank everybody. I mean, yes. this, it, this is amazing. It is not easy. And, uh, and to me, it's hard for the five of us, you know, we, we want to help make everything happen, not tie anybody's hands. Right, right. And, and I hope everybody understands that. And, and it's been amazing. It definitely has been enhanced so far, but I, I know I worry about the kids without connectivity. There's some still missing, and hopefully, as convoluted as this is going to be, hopefully it helps that. Yeah, and I do want to specifically thank all of the teachers for the last several weeks. We know that it has been a huge effort, and, and they've done a fantastic job. It truly has been an enhanced virtual yes. world. Um, they, they, took, they took up the challenge and, and have done a great job. So I, we still need to keep moving forward, right? And, and the, the virtual platform, it's going to be something that helps us springboard into the future, right? The the they're still going to need virtual for Wednesdays, right? Uh, for for the foreseeable future, and additionally, you know, we'll be talking about possible snow days or inclement weather days and the use of that going forward. So I think it's an invaluable experience, and I, I do want to thank all of our educators for just doing a, a taking up the challenge and doing a phenomenal job for these first several weeks of school and for the next s several more and, and until we move to the hybrid. Okay, um, with that, we can move to item 3G, which is the Family Life and Human Sexuality Committee. Dr. Lockhart, did you wanna kick us off on that? 
right over to Mr. Anderson. Let's. Uh, <laughs> okay. And there should be, um, I believe, some information in the uh, agenda packet on that. Yes. yes. So good evening, uh, once again, board members. I just um, wanted to go ahead and uh, make certain that we had an opportunity to have some discussion based on some of the feedback um, that you had shared with us. Uh, and so what um, what I've brought this evening to you is um, based on some of the discussion that we've already had, um, your recommendations or potential suggestions. Um, I wanted to share a few uh, pieces of documentation, some of which you may be familiar with already, and some that is being proposed um, as potential guidelines. Um, the first document that, that I wanted to share with you all this evening was a copy of our regulation from policy IGAB. Um, essentially, our policy is, is pretty much saying that we are following and complying with the state um, you know, uh, standards, and we are. Um, we wanted to spend, I wanted to spend some time this evening with you all in regards to the regulation. Um, you can see the regulation that's in front of you is I, I placed some um, potential recommendations and suggestions based on some of the conversation that we had over the past couple meetings. Um, in particular, uh, the second paragraph, um, it was very clear to me um, that we wanted to move from um, an opt-out to an opt-in. Um, our current regulation um, had had basically illustrated that that families would opt out, um, and that that was what is was in our that is what is presently in our regulation. And I was very clear to hear from the board uh, the last time that we met that that we wanted to change that. Um, so I've changed the language there to parents must provide written consent for their student to participate in the unit. Um, I went ahead and. Um, move forward and I said uh, for those students that do not have written consent to participate um, they would be excused and I changed the word worthwhile because I didn't think that was an, you know an appropriate word and I and I replaced it with appropriate activities um, and then if you scroll down then uh, the family life and human development committee shall be historically was appointed annually by the superintendent but based on our conversations um, I, I understood that you would like this committee brought to you for potential approval um, as we move forward. Um, and then um, the standing committee shall be comprised of educators. And then I struck and and put representatives and parents is what I heard loud and clear um, of the community. And so those are those are the um, the changes of the regulation that I'm bringing to you all this evening. And I felt like it illustrated based on the past couple of uh, brief conversations that we've had um, where the board was interested in moving forward with. Um, Jason, Jason. Yeah. Uh, and and um, the uh, third paragraph, um, and, and definitely it's, it's great. It will be approved by the Board of Education. Should it say or does it need to say who creates the committee that's going to be presented for approval? Should it say that? We can, sir. Yeah, uh, Mr. Kyler, we can certainly say that um, the Family Life and Human Development Committee will be brought to the board by um, our, our basically our associate supervisor of, of, of yes. health. Yep. Yes. I'll put that in there. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, I, I guess it's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, the next page. Um, I'm members. sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson. Sorry. Before we move on, do we? Uh, I'm trying to think to the other board appointed committees. Um, is that is that how we do it in the administrative regulations? Well, yeah. I mean, we we yeah. Like for example, I'll just use the one that you serve with me on uh, President Savigny with the teacher mm -hmm. um, advisory. We bring those names to you, um, you know, uh, each year, as does you know the rest of the committees. Mm -hmm. they right. Work to us. Right. Okay. They're brought to us by the appropriate staff yeah, member. Yeah, for me, I bring it to you. Yes. Right. Okay. So then, having it by the, the supervisor of whatever the right title is, then or associate supervisor. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, okay. The next page is something that's new, and it's something that I would like to place into maybe a guidelines. Um, I heard this from you all that that you basically wanted to um, have some sort of indication or illustration of the composition of the committee. Um, it was made very clear to me that we need to have 
Um, it's great that we have parents that also hold other occupations in our community that would be valuable to be on our committee. But I also heard loud and clear that we just want to have parents also that are on the committee that may not be overlapping. Um, and, and potentially even looking at our curriculum council um, as potential overlap there possibly also. So um, you can see there that we were looking at a maximum of 22 members. We don't want it to get too large. We've gotten feedback about other committees, curriculum council as an example, wonderful group, very large. Um, and so we have to keep it manageable. Um, so we are looking at professional educators of CCPS, obviously. Um, parents and guardians that have a student in CCPS, um, representation of the health department, our, health, our school health council, um, our curriculum council, um, health care providers and professionals, a student representative, which we did find a new student representative, which we're very excited about that. Um, Emily Kim, who is um, from Liberty uh, High School, will be serving as our student representative based on your approval. And then we wanted to make sure that we had at least one parent or guardian from each of our feeder areas so that we have um, representation from all over the county. Um, so basically we look at each high school and making sure that we have a family member or a guardian, a parent or a guardian from those feeder areas all around the county. Okay, so not necessarily one from each of the seven high schools, but one from each of the seven high school feeder areas. Correct. I believe... Okay. Um, the one we just added was um, a parent from the South Carroll feeder area, which is at Mount Airy Middle, I believe. Okay. Now, Dr. Dorsey, were you on this committee? Should should a board member be on it? Does that go without saying? Weren't you on this committee? No, I was not on this committee. Oh, okay. I thought you were. Uh -uh. <laughs> Should it be a board member or not really? I guess it's a, if it's a board appointed committee, we probably do want to have a sitting board member assigned to it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to put my hand up for that one if, yeah. unless somebody else yeah. has a strong desire. But yeah, I'm, yeah. I think that makes sense. Okay. okay, well, I can be an alternate for that then. Okay. Okay. So it's just like teacher advisory. Um, okay, great. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> um, so what I'll do then is I'll go ahead and put that in as part of the comp the composition as well, as far okay. as far as the guidelines. Okay. Um, and so do we? Did we? We didn't say necessarily that we wanted one. So we said one parent or guardian from each high school feeder area. But do we also want to make sure that we have at least one parent, or at least two parents, from each level? Right, um, so that you've got middle, elementary, middle, and high representation. Okay, so what I can do is I can work on the second bullet uh, where it says parents or guardians that have students in CPS and representing each instructional level, and you're saying two, you say? Um, I, I, so does this work out to be, you know, about nine parents that we want overall? So yeah, you have your seven right at the as as your feeder, right? So we'd have at least seven from a feeder perspective. Um, right. Does it make it possible if we did? You if do, we did, if you do six more, you're thirteen. You're over half of the committee. No, no, no. I didn't mean mm -mm. six more. I I just meant that. Th that so that, if there's if there's nine parents. Okay. In total, it means you'd want to have at least one from each feeder pattern and three from each of the so, levels. So really, or, or just some, a, com a comment on that. Or at so, least two, yeah, at gotcha. least two from each level, right? So something like that, just so that we have cross. But they cross can overlap, right? So they the could feeder. overlap. Yes. They yes. could absolutely overlap. Okay. Let me, let me, yeah, let me write that down and I'll fix that. Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I completely agree with your comments about, um, you know, with it being parents, like I really don't want to see, and I don't know if what other board members agree with, agree with this or not, but personally, I don't want to see teachers doing double duty as parents, right? And I, I don't want to see, you know, healthcare representatives in the community doing double duty as, as parents. I, I want, I, I would really like to see, you know, some, we, we've got educators on the on the group. We've got healthcare professionals on the group. We've got the school ca uh, council, health council folks. I want I want this to be kind of or organic in terms of like the parents that join the group, not that they're sort of handpicked and they and they fit into into categories that we've already got covered. I I, I think we want some 
diversity in thought and perspective on this group, and we definitely want the, the parent perspective in addition to all the other um, health-related and educational and educator perspectives. I, okay. um, so I, does that make sense that we, we don't want the double duty? Yeah, I understand that. It, it brings me to my next piece, though, is so there is a um, – so we as, – as was mentioned last time we met, you know, we are – trying to move forward and, and we have some things we need to get done and we wanted to get the committee working. We, we presented uh, a list of members this year and there is some overlap there, President Savigny, um, but there is also representation from, it, it meets all the other requirements other than ha maybe having two from each level. I may be wrong on that, but we may have that here. Um, I think, but I'm I think wondering may have for this. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think you may have it already. Yeah, I mean, for this year, is this sufficient to move forward this year so we can get our work done, or would you like us to start over? I think looking at it, add, add Ms. Savigny, and it looks good. Yeah, I think for this year, since there are some things that, that need to get done, I don't want to hold it up with, you know, finding additional people, but I, I think if we can... In the if future... We, if yes. we can look look to a you know slightly modified uh, composition maybe next year, um, as this is brought to the board for for approval next year, you know we'll we'll make sure that we satisfy those pieces. But for this year, let's get moving. Yeah, because this is, this is time sensitive. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know so that. Um, I will go ahead and add, Mr. Kyler, as you just said, I'll be adding President Savigny and then Dr. Dorsey as the alternate. Um, and then the final document, I also, excuse me, um, board members, I wanted to share also, there's been one modification to the to the committee member uh, list that you have um, at the very top. Um, please strike the, the name, um, uh, Ms. Dickerson, and please, that'll now be Emily Kim, um, who's our student representative. She's SGA, CCSGA co-president, Liberty High School. I'm sorry, where was that, Mr. Anderson? I'm sorry, it's the very top of the first page of the actual committee members. Oh, okay. Um, I believe the copy that I gave you all still had Mrs. Dickerson mm -hmm. as, as the student member, but I had Emily over there. So it's please cross Mrs. Dickerson and put Emily Kim, Liberty High School. Gotcha. And then the final document is um, the intent form. We've revised the, in, the intent form um, so that it, that it's, uh, it can be synonymous um, at multiple um, grade levels. Um, and so basically, um, as you requested, this is, uh, um, we are covering opt-in and opt-out by having to have to check one of the boxes here of I would like my child included or I would like my child excluded. And I think that was a recommendation from one of the board members. I don't know if it was Ms. Pataglia or, or someone else in the last week or two weeks ago. And is that a is that a change from how the wrong. form currently looks? I, I know that we, we currently had an opt in. Does it did it look similar to this or did it change slightly? You know, I, I can't speak to that right now because I hadn't seen it historically. Um, it, I'm guessing um, that it's for the most part we were trying to keep it uh, somewhat familiar, um, but I can get you what what it used to look like. Okay, okay, but I, I think this does yes. represent what we had discussed at the last meeting. Okay, yes. good. That was my goal. Okay. Right, and I think in the past, if my child may or may not um, participate, right. so right. Yep. this is good. Okay. Okay. Great. So I will take the recommendations in regards to the re uh, regulation, and I will take the recommendations as it relates to the uh, composition, and I will get those changed, and I will make sure the board gets updated copies on that. Um, and I will also let you know, President Savigny and Dr. Dorsey, of when the meeting is. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Anderson. You're very well. Thank you. Okay. okay. Board members, any other questions on that item? No? Okay, great. Um, then we will move on to unfinished business and new business. Uh, any other topics that folks want to bring up? No? I did have one thing that I had wanted to bring up under the under the hybrid discussion, and I forgot before we closed down that section. Um, but Dr. Lockard, at, at previous meetings, we had talked about maybe doing some like videos and messaging 
um, by the administrators to go out to community members um, so they can kind of see the, the look and feel of what the, what the schools are gonna look like so that they can kind of prepare their kids. You know, yep. it's not gonna look the same as, as what you remember your school looking um, you know, previously. So we had talked about putting out sort of some videos like that from the administrators. Is that moving ahead? That or is we in the works. In fact, Ms. Gaddis and Ms. McCabe and I were just talking about that. Um, we wanted to get we wanted to get started and get going uh, with with our school year, and we've started to shift our attention to sort of marketing. Here are all the things you can expect to see in your school, and so you should be seeing some things coming soon. Okay. Through our communications, we're also going to be. Um, I know City's working with school-based folks to start start that sort of push, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody had had said, "Oh, I'd love to come in and see." And I, I wish we could actually bring you into the school, but we can't. <laughs> right. Um, and so the next best thing is to give you glimpses and show you and communicate with you. Here's what you can expect for your child in terms of space and markings and hand washing and hand sanitizer stations and the whole nine yards. Cindy, so did you want to add anything else to that? Uh, you're right on target with that. The principals are excited to... Um, be able to start that communication um, uh, you know they're excited to uh, be thinking about having their students back in the building and um, as I've been out in the buildings uh, with them it, it's been great to see what they've set up um, and what they have ready for our students so they're gonna have a lot of fun um, getting out those messages to their community and I'd like to add to that that um, I am aware of couple of schools. In fact, um, Northwest Middle had invited me to their like chat and chew session that they had with their parent um, community. And again, it was on this very thing, you know, this is what the school will look like um, when your students return. And again, just the, um, the excitement of looking forward to having the students return to the building was just very evident. And I didn't um, attend the um, other session, but I understand that William Winchester also had like a, a chat and chew um, session with their parent um, community and covered pretty much the same information. In fact, had slides available um, to share with the parents. So again, the message is getting out there and um, hopefully as many parents as possible are taking advantage of those opportunities. Right. Yes, definitely. Thank you for mentioning that. I know that the um the um, chat and chew at William Winchester, they had, um, they had about 60 parents show up wow. for that online. So yeah, those things are being well attended. That's wonderful. Um, I guess that has to go into the new business. Do we need to add to our dress code policy regarding masks? Um, I don't know that we would, well, I, maybe, maybe we should ask uh, Mr. O'Mealy, but I mean, I, I think that we c can we just make a statement that masks are considered part of your clothing, right? Like it's a required, and you know, so that it, it has to comply with the, anything the that dress falls, code standards. Yeah, within dress I, code. I don't think that you need a change in policy, but perhaps a communication to that effect. So, for example, if a student was to wear a Confederate battle flag mask, that would clearly be a violation of our existing dress code policies, and they would be told to remove it. And that would be true whether it's in virtual instruction or when they return to the school building. Okay. Right. So we are, like, for our in-school in programs that have started, we've been communicating masks are required. We would be doing the same thing uh, as we gear up and approach the hybrid uh, as well. So, Ed, you're saying that that suffices. We don't necessarily need to change our dress or make an addition to our dress code policy because this is really hopefully very temporary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but we have right. signs I, on I the think, doors. I think, however, yeah, they, they should uh, be there. a communication to that effect that, yes, this is part of the dress code, too. And so if you can't wear it on your T-shirt, you can't wear it on your mask either. Right. Okay. okay. And, John, we have the foldable signage in front of all the schools that, that also point out that masks are required as well for anybody approaching the school, correct? 
Correct. There's signage. There will be signage at every entrance if there's not already, and and communications like that um, do go out. It's it's well documented in the plan and, and all the correspondence we send. Okay. All right, board members. Any other items under unfinished or new business? Well, when you're looking at the dates, maybe we could add the groundbreaking um, ceremony that we're looking forward to. October yes, we should. And what is the, uh, so if we can state publicly, what is the time and place for that? Find it October here. October 7th. Thank you. At the Career and Technology Center, right? Right. I have 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock. October yeah. 7th, 3 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yes, 3 p.m. Okay, great. So then at 5, oh, uh, before I read these off, um, Oh, no, I'll read them. So at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, September 30th, 2020, we have the Capital Improvement Program hearing here in the boardroom at 125 North Court Street, Westminster. And we also have uh, at 5 p.m. on Wednesday, October 14th, 2020, the regularly scheduled board meeting with citizen participation at 5 p.m. and 6.30 p.m. in the boardroom here at 125 North Court Street. And then October 7th, we have the groundbreaking ceremony at the Career and Tech Center at 3 p.m., and uh, I believe that's it for upcoming meetings. And I will remind uh, folks that we do need to go back into closed session um, immediately following ending this meeting. And with that, I will call for a motion to adjourn. Marsha. So moved. <laughs> <laughs> moved by Miss Herbert. I'm looking at all my wins. She wasn't on the dime on that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, 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 Wendy. I'll second. All right. It moved by Ms. Herbert and seconded by Ms. Battaglia. All those in favor? One, can one, I? One item of discussion. One. It is not 10 o'clock yet. It is not 10 o'clock yet. <laughs> so <laughs> all those in favor, can I get a verbal aye, please? Aye. 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 Oh. May I just make a quick announcement real quick? Oh, oh sure. Sorry. You've been so quiet this tonight. This Friday evening, I will be participating in a virtual town hall slash discussion on racial injustice in education with the state student member on the Board of Ed and other student reps and members from across the state. So I encourage students to attend and view it virtually. Okay. It's an announcement. D Devanshi, could you give the time and place of that again? It is going to be virtual um, from 6 to 8 this Friday evening. And um, the forum's link is to register for the Zoom call will be is on my social media. So, okay. And they can email me if they would like to know more about it. Okay, mm. great. Thanks, Devanshi. Yeah. Okay, so we did have the motion to adjourn by Ms. Herbert I and seconded moved. by Ms. Battaglia. And all those in favor, can I get a verbal aye, please? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening.